Hello and welcome everyone to the annual conference for the Clean Energy Transition Partnership. This is our second day of the event and I hope that everyone is uh, has learned a lot now from the, the exciting meetings that we had yesterday. Uh, my name is Christina Starboy. I am from the Swedish Energy Agency and we are a co, uh, co um, co-coordinator for the Clean Energy uh, Transition Partnership. Um, we are going to start this, uh, this meeting today, or this session, we have a focus on research, development, and innovation projects in the center. Uh, and we will be going from now, 10 o'clock, uh, to about 1 uh, p.m. in the afternoon. Um, let's see. I'd like to just start by showing everyone uh, the agenda. This is the plan for uh, this session. Uh, we're going to uh, start with uh, hearing about all the different challenges we have in the partnership. Uh, at, uh, in a moment, we will start with the first challenge, which is integrated zero, net zero emission energy systems, followed by challenge two, enhanced zero uh, emission power technologies. Number three, uh, enabling climate neutrality storage technologies and renewable fuels and CCU CCS. The fourth challenge is efficient zero emission heating and cooling solutions. After that, we'll have a short coffee break. Then we'll continue on to integrated regional energy systems and uh, followed by uh, challenge six, which is integrated industrial energy systems. And finally, challenge seven, which is integrated integration in the built environment before wrapping up. Um, I think with that being said, that's the plan for, for the session. We'll go on now uh, to the first challenge where I'd like to introduce uh, Michele De Nigris and Giuseppe Palazzo uh, that will be presenting uh, integrated net zero en emission uh, energy systems. Michaela, Giuseppe, welcome. Thank you very much, Cristina, and uh, thank you for having us here uh, as uh, challenge number one of the Clean Energy Transition Partnership. You uh, know that the challenge number one is dedicated to an integrated net zero emission energy system. And just to give you uh, an outline of uh, the mission of the Transition Initiative number one, dedicated to the integrated energy system. Uh, as a mission, we have the objective to contribute in the developing of the net zero integrated energy system, considering the electricity system uh, as a backbone uh, of the future uh, net zero uh, integrated system. Uh, we want to foster the development of solutions, technologies, instruments for the integrated energy system with special reference to the electricity network uh, as the main vector uh, for the development and for the integration of renewable energy sources. We, of course, want, as far as this is an integrated energy system, we want to foster also the integration of other energy vectors and other energy grids, for example, gas, fuel, hydrogen, of course, through the storage and, of course, through the um, conversion aspects, the so-called power to X uh, applications. We want to develop a system in which renewable energy consumption is maximized, of course, looking at the peculiarities of the electricity system, we need to have a very, very flexible uh, system in such a way uh, that the uh, uh, balance between the uh, uh, momentary production of uh, the moment to moment production of electricity is well balanced. Uh, with the uh, timely, uh, with the timely uh, consumption of electricity, and of course, this is carried out only through flexibility system, which can be reached and can be gathered 
along the entire value chain of the energy system, generation, transmission, distribution, and end use. Of course, to carry out this goal, uh, we will need to have a lot of control, a lot of observability, and uh, this is uh, enabled by digital technologies. But uh, we also want to foster the activities dedicated to circularity, circularity, efficiency as the core uh, of the integrated energy system, flexibility, sorry, uh, efficiency at all levels. So from the generation, storage, transmission, distribution, and end use, with the special reference, of course, to the electrification of the end use sector, which is one of the vehicles for increasing the efficiency at the uh, end use level. We also want to foster participation of the citizen as prosumers or members uh, of the energy communities. This is why we always look at the three layer uh, project, the three layer uh, uh, developments that do not only consider technology, but they also consider market and uh, uh, participation of the final user and acceptance. So for today, uh, we wanted to make the link between uh, projects that have already delivered some uh, important results uh, as far as uh, we are at the very beginning uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the calls and of the uh, uh, projects of the transition initiatives uh, and of the clean energy transition partnership, we needed to select some projects from uh, other sources and the sister source, I think uh, we can leverage the results from uh, is the ERANET smart energy uh, system uh, program. So we have asked then uh, to uh, one of the uh, numerous projects of the uh, ERANET smart energy system to uh, give us an insight about what are the uh, development, what are the projects, uh, sorry, and what are the products uh, that these uh, projects have uh, come to, uh, uh, to reach uh, uh, during uh, their development to try to understand what can be the contribution of these uh, projects to the uh, um, to the challenges of the transition initiative number one of the clean energy transition partnership so it is my pleasure to uh, welcome to this uh, meeting uh, professor Th paul toy uh, from uh, strathclyde uh, university uh, and uh, uh, thank you very much for joining us and uh, welcome to this uh, uh, to this conference. So I'm just want to ask you are you, you have been or you are the representative or the the coordinator of the uh, 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 of the CS 2022 project. Uh, and uh, we want to hear from you uh, what uh, the project uh, is about or has been about. Uh, how it can contribute to the uh, transition initiative uh, challenges. And as far as your project is uh, somehow finished, what is the legacy, what are the products, and what is the knowledge uh, that can be uh, uh, taken to the Clean Energy Transition Partnership on the one hand, and what is the legacy towards the uh, potential uh, projects of the Clean Energy Transition Partnership uh, TRI-1. So welcome, Paul, and uh, uh, I will uh, uh, switch the different slides uh, of your presentation so you just tell me uh, that you want the next slide. Thank you and welcome. Great. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Yes, I'm based uh, here in Scotland and um, we've had a really positive experience in engaging with the Smart Energy Systems Initiative uh, and through our project um, SICE 2022. It was intended to complete by 2022. However, because of COVID, we only completed at the end of sep September this year. So everything is quite fresh and new. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, our project was to um, develop virtual power plant cluster clusters for industry and district decarbonisation. 
and we dealt both with industry and also with um, towns and industrial estates and, and other district scale uh, applications. Uh, our main thing was to develop virtual power plant um, technology solutions uh, to maximize the value from renewable storage flex and smart controls. Our main thing uh, was to implement um, model predictive control using forecasting of both the markets, uh, the end users, and uh, using models uh, of the individual energy assets to do the optimization. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, uh, Strathclyde in Scotland was the lead. Uh, we had an industry lead uh, from a, a company called Energy Technology Centre, who are a, 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 they are a supportive company that provides facilities for others to develop systems in, in the energy field. And we also had partners from Turkey, uh, Best Transformer in Turkey, who developed a smart transformer uh, with flex and monitoring capabilities and also Magtel from Spain, who developed a parallel VPP implementation for the solar farms that they manage. Next slide, please. So we, um, we were very aware at the beginning that virtual power plant control technologies could support decarbonisation, provide the flex that the electricity market needs, provide value propositions for end users uh, through self-consumption, through exploiting flexibility markets or variable tariffs, um, but um, technical economic solutions were not available or well developed. Um, and through our project, we, de we developed and implemented a control platform uh, over multiple energy pools and energy asset types uh, that included the model-based predictive controls um, and forecasting. And we also um, provided a modeling environment that lets the value of um, uh, flexibility virtual power plant control uh, be assessed at the design stage um, so that it can be the value proposition can be clear and and this is a, a very important aspect the third thing we developed is we took the um, test uh, environment and development environment at the industry partner and we upgraded it so they can do hardware in a virtual power plant loop so they can operate technologies in a flex environment under vpp control and we generated a number of demonstrators and we are very engaged and we're, we're looking to move forward um, and we're looking at the next series of calls uh, to take the technology forward. Uh, next slide. I'll just go very quickly through this. We, we, we used existing elements of software and put our supervisory control layer in terms of both software um, and some hardware to support the software in place. And we've had it running um, across more than one year at multiple sites at TRL6. And we have good data sets and good experience um, of different control options, for example, on different asset types and different situations. And uh, next slide, please. The, this, this is just a, an illustration that we have the hardware in the loop test center set up with VPP data acquisition and smart control. And we can run simulation of the markets, simulation of different technologies and have individual assets tested under those environments. And we can also take data from people's new technologies so they can be included in the VPP value assessment software so that their future value and their future applications can be identified and the technology development can target those applications more effectively. Uh, next slide, please. Obviously, we, uh, we, we took this out to end users, not just the development areas, and we used a, a village in the north of Scotland where we created um, a microgrid um, that was fully instrumented. It had large-scale wind production and more capacity of wind generation than the peak consumption, um, and lots of PV uh, and lots of dwellings with heat pumps. And of particular interest, we had uh, EV charging, but also we had uh, two social housing blocks uh, where we installed energy centres with instrumentation. Uh, so they had, in one case, PV with a uh, heat pump plus thermal storage, uh, and in the other case, solar thermal plus heat pump plus thermal storage feeding block, blocks of flats. And we were able to do um, 
smart control using the VPP software, both to optimize self-consumption of the on-site renewables uh, on the buildings, but also to synchronize with uh, wind and a wind-based tariff. Um, and this was an interesting play box and is something we want to take forward. Um, some of the financial um, services required to do uh, the smart um, control and to give value to both the wind generation company and the uh, the end user, that's an area that we, 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 we've investigated, but nobody is taking that service forward as, it, as we speak just now. And this is something we are really looking to investigate uh, in the next stage. Uh, next slide. So the, the value assessment um, software can be applied to assets that don't yet exist. And in Scotland, there's lots of interest in hydrogen production and hydrogen developers have come to us and we've used them as an example in our project uh, for how we would optimize their system within the electricity markets, but also uh, the, with uh, optimizing the integration of storage uh, and generation technology. And actually, what's the value of implementing the advanced controls um, that we have based on modeling and forecasting over a simple rule-based control, for example, that normal, it would be normal operation or business as usual. And we found that we could really see um, great reduction in, in end cost of hydrogen uh, for green hydrogen production if uh, VPP was implemented and if the system was optimized uh, to provide a balancing mode uh, while producing hydrogen uh, and maximize self-consumption during appropriate periods, but also support the wider grid flexibility requirements and avoid high cost import. So th that's the kind of assessment tool that we, we developed and one of the applications. Next slide, please. And um, the other application that we've scoped out for future application is on industrial estates. And our technology centre is on an industrial estate and now is going to act as a catalyst for other buildings in a cluster around it to, to, to create a local smart grid and energy trading platform across uh, multiple buildings. Uh, next slide, please. So the, uh, the next challenge is uh, we've taken, we're a university, our in, our, our uh, main industrial partner has been uh, a test centre uh, and now we need to take the next step and find partners that are going to develop the business services and take the, the commercial aspects um, of the VPP platform we have forward from TRL6 to TRL9. We need to um, get those commercial processes uh, piloted, streamlined and de-risked so that they are um, with secure costs, there are lots of uncertainties at the moment. Uh, so that's one thing that needs to be done, I think, for everybody. And then um, the supply chain is, is, is the other side of things. So all aspects of technical, commercial delivery and operational supply chain need to be developed um, because people aren't used to uh, designing in flex and, and projecting what the value of flex will be and, and come out with a secure contractual base for implementation for all of the people involved. Thank you. I will uh, need to uh, uh, warn the fact that uh, we have uh, really uh, very few minutes also. To no, that, 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 that's fine. This is the last slide. <laughs> Thank so, you so very yeah. much. In fact, it was not exactly the last slide. Ah, yeah, I, I sent you too many. <laughs> I, I will skip the other ones. In fact, uh, you have developed a certain number of uh, products and uh, uh, these products, uh, and uh, uh, you wish also to develop uh, uh, to uh, that these products be taken up uh, by other by other projects. Um, in fact, uh, with the uh, call 2022 of the Clean Energy Transition Partnership, we have uh, 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 selected essentially three projects uh, for the TRI one. And uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, among the different projects uh, we have uh, uh, chosen for this uh, uh, presentation, the, pro the project uh, uh, that is going to start called the Manoeuvre, uh, and uh, uh, they will probably not take forward your products, but they will leverage the uh, modeling and the applications uh, that you have delivered potentially uh, to uh, uh, further develop or to further to use as an input 
for uh, other activities uh, that are foreseen in the project. So uh, I will uh, welcome Siri Mathisen from uh, uh, Norway. Thank you very much, Michaela. So um, I want to talk to you about the maneuver project, but first I want to give thanks to Paul for his presentation about the ongoing SIAS 22 uh, project. And I think it was particularly interesting to hear about the virtual power plant demonstrations, Findhorn, and also how you're integrating your system in the actual test system using the system in the loop. Uh, and in contract, in uh, contrast to this ongoing project, the Maneuver project has not yet started, but it will start in December this year. The next slide, please. Uh, the project is coordinated by Sintef Energy Research based in Norway, uh, and we will use the high science capability of the ERA Center of Excellence on energy transition modeling uh, and work towards closing the gap between pan-European and more detailed regional energy system models. Uh, and we have quite a lot of really competent partners on board, uh, and we plan to adapt the existing clean energy scenarios for 2050 with current EU policies and energy plans, and to analyze these scenarios for the European energy system. These results will then be the framework for nine case studies that will use their own models on specific countries or regions uh, and sectors and topics, then to compare the results with the NSFPs of their respective countries. So when you use the pan-European results in the local models, we will use the case study results again to, use a, uh, to perform a second pan-European study when the adjusted NSFPs and capacities from the regional case studies are included. Next, please. So the main objectives for the maneuver project will be to improve and coordinate the energy system modeling across Europe and to provide open scientific evidence and research-based results that can facilitate emissions reductions for a clean energy transition. Uh, and we want to provide robust pathways for the European energy system a feedback and advice to the NSFPs, a toolbox for conducting energy transition studies at European and national or regional level, and consistent energy system modeling data sets and scenario project projections, and a coordination between national energy plans and EU-wide transition goals. But as I said, the project is due to start in December, and we will have our kickoff meeting in Trondheim in January, so it will be uh, very exciting to be able to present actual results for you in the coming years. That was it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Siri. Uh, you have, uh, 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 in terms of focus of your uh, project, uh, the uh, availability of tools for proven planning, operation, performance and resilience, uh, taking into consideration also sustainability uh, of the uh, future uh, integrated or the future power system or uh, integrated system and i think uh, you can leverage also the uh, modeling uh, at uh, uh, local level uh, that can be provided also by the SACE uh, 2022 so just to wrap up in uh, uh, one uh, last minute <laughs> Of my uh, of the presentation of the TRI uh, uh, one, uh, so the new project will have the potential to leverage the up to date information also through the clean energy transition partnership knowledge management platform. So this is going to be, uh, of course, one of the features uh, that are going to be that is going to be developed within uh, the different TRIs, but TRI one in particular, for example. We have seen that the maneuver project that is now going to start can consider in the energy system modeling that, of course, goes from the overall European system, but leveraging also uh, local uh, use cases, the data sets and scenario projection, uh, uh, the, uh, the use of the uh, virtual power plant models 
that are developed and that are made available uh, by the, uh, the project uh, CS2022. We will help as TRI leads and as TRI office all the projects that are uh, starting uh, in the framework of the set partnership uh, with the stakeholders and the need owners to adapt their output and deliverables, of course, to maximize the project impact, but also uh, the application of the project's uh, results towards the final aim uh, of the uh, clean energy transition partnership. So we will foster knowledge exchange. We will foster these opportunities among the TRI uh, among the TRI uh, projects, and of course, uh, not only the 2022 projects, but the projects that are going to be selected uh, based on the call 2023. Uh, so, for the moment, uh, I am uh, uh, finished here. I think it's uh, 10.25 and uh, uh, I think I am exactly on time. So, Perfect. thank you. Thank you very much, Michaela. Thank you very much. Uh, now we will go on uh, to the next challenge here, uh, where we have uh, enhanced zero emission power technologies. And it is Francesco... Um, uh, Francesco Basila and Raquel Nociera that will be presenting this session. Welcome. Uh, please tell us a little bit more about this challenge and the projects that you have. Uh... See, do I hear you? Yeah. Oh, here. Yes, Hello. now we hear you. Hello to everyone. Uh, thank you for um, um, the uh, opportunity to present the enhanced zero emission technology, our technology uh, transition initiatives. Uh, we, uh, our mission is to develop a zero emission power technology and solution, uh, which is of course uh, the backbone of future energy system and um, able to actually deliver the carbon neutral electricity and accessible to all and uh, secure also uh, considering the uh, um, geopolitics scenario. The um, TRI is dedicated to a pool of uh, technology and uh, we have uh, um, actually focused the first year on um, uh, most of them, so photovoltaics, um, concentrated solar power, um, wind, um, offshore energy, uh, ocean energy, and uh, and that's that's the main point. Um, we, uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, maybe uh, we have selected uh, in our calls two uh, different set of projects. The first one at high TRL, uh, where four projects have been selected with an average um, funding of two point two um, million euro and uh, um, other 10 projects at lower TRL um, with uh, an average uh, funding of 1.3 million euro. We have actually, um, in this pool of project, um, have the participation of more than uh, 20 agency, and maybe in the next slide, uh, we uh, can also see how the uh, project portfolio is uh, covering the thematic area I just mentioned. You see that the main um, five of those projects are related to photovoltaics, uh, uh, then offshore renewables and wind three um, account for three uh, projects, um, two projects for ocean energy and one for concentrated solar power. Uh, sorry, the opposite, two projects for concentrated solar power and one from the ocean energy uh, technology. And the next slide, we can see also that um, we have the representation of 16 countries uh, in this project. Uh, um, eight countries account for the 8% of the participants. Uh, uh, and uh, while we have also uh, at least uh, three entities uh, self funded United Kingdom, uh, in Germany, and other um, entities. And uh, we have also uh, three. Uh, country outside the uh, European Union, so Israel, Turkey, and United Kingdom. It's a quite uh, huge number of um, uh, 
um, country and we are happy about the spread of our and the coverage of our uh, portfolio of projects. So um, what we decide with Raquel uh, that will uh, facilitate the next part of the meeting uh, is uh, to uh, make our project um, speak for uh, the description and help in, uh, as the, in the description of the TRI since it was very difficult to select uh, from previous project a specific uh, technology and a specific TRL. So we will have a um, short pitch on the different projects. Um, the floor is yours, Raquel. Thanks a lot, Raquel Nocella, representing the Ministry of University and Research, uh, supporting TRI2. Now we have a, a quite a challenging marathon with 14 projects which are in our project portfolio who have been uh, asked to kindly present their concept idea in one minute. So let's get started with the first project. The name is Captivating Act Fast, so quite an incitement to accelerate the clean, the clean energy transition. And the floor is to Nicola Spalato from the Taltec, Taltec an Estonian uh, research organization. Nicola, the floor is yours. One minute each. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you hear me. So my name is Nicola Spalato and I am from Tallinn University of Technology, Estonia. And I am the coordinator of, of the project, which is called Sustainable Antimony Calcogenite Fin Film Tandem Solar Cell Technology. So the consortium is composed of three universities from Estonia, Italy, and Spain, and we are supported by a strong advisory board with uh, two companies from Germany and Austria. So uh, what is the, the concept behind, I want to move to the next slide, is that uh, we are addressing the following challenges. So in line with the European uh, uh, big goal by 2050 to, to reach this target of net zero emission, uh, the PV can be a very, it is a very sustainable pillar for, uh, to contribute to this target. So, uh, in order to achieve this, we have to go beyond this traditional silicon photovoltaic, which is, uh, very popular. So we have to, to increase the capacity of the PV technology and to bring new, new PV, uh, materials uh, in the market and also products. So this can be building uh, integrated photovoltaics, uh, 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 products for IoT, Internet of, of Things. So uh, uh, the main the main idea here we we come with these uh, tandem devices, which is a new technology. And what we address here is this: we want to reduce the cost per watt for module production and also to, to increase the performance and the reliability of these uh, products. So they- Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Nikolai. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I, yeah, sorry, time is over. Uh, so we pass uh, very quickly to the second pitch presentation. The project is Detective Coordinated by Politecnico of Torino. Laura Savoldi, floor is yours. Thanks a lot. So Detective stands for development of a novel tube bundle cavity linear receiver for CSP applications. The consortium is, uh, is uh, composed by uh, Politecnico di Torino, that is uh, my institution, Plataforma Solar del Maria in Spain, and KTH and Absolicon uh, um, um, University and uh, private company in Sweden. So the challenge is uh, uh, concerned the, the uh, concentrated solar power field and uh, is to increase the efficiency of linear uh, absorbers and the parabolic trough collector a specific target. And the idea is to do what you see in the, in the central uh, figure. So to substitute as a plug and play object, whatever is the actual re receiver uh, within the same envelope with a bundle of tubes uh, that are capable to absorb much more uh, uh, energy and capture and uh, keep in the cavity the, the um, uh, rays reflected by the mi mirrors. Uh, we will perform a thermal hydraulic uh, thermomechanic uh, assessment before designing, manufacturing, and test the component. And the idea is uh, to deliver in three years, uh, starting from uh, December this year, higher uh, efficiency, uh, higher efficiency product uh, with a reduced footprint, uh, a clear go-to-market go-to-market strategy, uh, with also the support of uh, of uh, uh, all the people around this virtual table. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Laura. So we go quickly to third project, EPOBOC, quite difficult to pronounce, but Jan Benek, tell us more in one minute. Thanks. 
Thank you. So I'd like to present shortly our project EpoBorg, which is easy to fabricate, uh, easy to fabricate both sides polysilicon passivating cutting bottom cells for perovskite silicon panim devices. Next, please. Yeah, okay. So consortium. Uh, no, please go back. The consortium con uh, consists on partners from Germany, France, and uh, Netherlands. This found for ESET here on University of Trenta as a uh, scientific partners and ESET Green Tech as our in uh, industrial partner. Next, please. Uh, as stated in the title, the aim of our project is to develop uh, uh, perovskite on silicon tandem um, solar cell uh, with a focus on the silicon um, bottom cell. And of course, the uh, aim is to have a high, high efficiency device, but we also have additional uh, aims. So we'd like to have a bottom cell which is uh, really resource saving. So we are aiming for CO2 low, low wafers, and the, uh, we won't use any rare materials like indium and um, others. And of course, we're aiming also for an easy fabrication. So it's also we're aiming for a quite lean processing chain to have an easy fabrication of this um, final device. I think that's the basics of our projects. And I think that's for the moment. Thanks. Thanks, Jan. We will have the opportunity to discover more in our in next occasion. But now we move us to the next project, which is Hybrid Print, um, coordinated by Dance University and Marcin Luzaka. Floor is yours for one minute. Marcin, you're there. Uh, I guess no. So we can move forward to the next presentation. The project is more. Uh, in this case, uh, we have as Swedish coordinator Rize and Peter Petrov. Are you there? Good morning. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. On behalf of Rice, I'm a project manager of uh, Project More. Uh, next slide, please. The main objective of MORE is to develop, uh, demonstrate, and validate full transferability, harmonization, and reproducibility of multi-degradation results validated at laboratory level through subcomponent level and accelerated multi-degradation pilot testing to a potential demonstration in relevant industrial environment uh, of the user cases. Uh, both user cases uh, represent uh, offshore renewable energy sector. Partners uh, on the project are Wave Piston. Seal Engineering, RICE Coordinator, Sintef, Servi Group, NTNU, GCE Node, Core Power, and uh, Vega. Next slide, please. The expected outcomes are a development and validation in relevant in environment of breakthrough innovative solutions for increasing the overall efficiency and reliability of uh, a renewable power production at system level. Uh, Minimize the environmental impact, accelerate time to market, and reduce the development time and cost of renewable energy technologies. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the MORE project will develop a, an alternative path focusing on maximizing the performance of key components at subsystems at early development stage through an improved material selection methodology. That is all. Thanks a lot. Excellent timing. And now the next project is Next Gen, Next Generation, uh, coordinated by a young startup and uh, Liselotte Ulgarda. Floor is yours. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, so we are doing the project named Demonstrating the Next Generation of Direct Drive Generators for Wind Power. Uh, so the background, as you may know, European wind industry, wind industry is struggling to deliver on already planned and expected projects. Meanwhile, we need to accelerate faster. And what Agnesia proposed, which is a Swedish small startup company, is a novel direct drive generator that saves up to 90% of the weight and materials used in the generator, while at the same time improving efficiency. This, is opens, this opens up a lot of opportunity for building turbines both larger and cheaper and more efficient. Uh, so to prove this very bold statement on this young technology, we have teamed up with Fraunhofer in Germany and ETU in Denmark, with the goals to design and evaluate a 10 megawatt generator, to validate this to TRL5 by building a prototype, and to understand the potential uh, impact that this can have. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, and to do this, we will work with different tasks. One is, of course, to work with the design and the novel generator and to find a roadmap from TRL3 to TRL5 and also beyond. Then to do hardware in the loop testing of this prototype in the Fraunhofer's DinoLab lab. Uh, and then to do aerolistic simulations to prove the impact on system levels. That's basically it. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Liselotte. Now we are uh, moving backward because Marcin is with us. So can uh, we can go quickly to hybrid wind, please, Marcin. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction and the opportunity to present. Uh, can you go for the at the next slide? Uh, uh, we have the international consortium: Poland, Denmark, Germany, and Belgium. And uh, we challenged uh, ourselves uh, to see if we can deliver condition monitoring system to predict the forthcoming uh, failures of, of the turbine and its components uh, disregarding the extreme weather conditions. Uh, this is because the signal from the condition monitoring sensors can be affected by the changing uh, temperature and uh, provide a false uh, alarm. So we will apply a hybrid method, being a mixture of experimental and simulation. We will be active in the laboratory in a controlled environment, and then we will demonstrate uh, in the field, in the summer, in the winter time. And as a result, uh, we expect uh, that uh, we, we will bring the levelized cost of energy down, as the maintenance will be more predictable, so more cost effective, and we are also going to improve uh, the life cycle of uh, components. Thank you. Thanks, Marcin. Looking forward to see the results. And now we are going very quickly to the next project, the North Storm. Uh, Carsten, uh, up to you now. Yes, thank you very much. So I'm Carsten Bitkoff from Research Center Jülich. Um, and I will present the uh, project Nordstorm. Well, here you can see our consortium. And the, the goal of our, our project is to, to develop the next generation silicon heterojunction solar cell and module technology, which is try, we are trying to replace uh, scars and pop, uh, future expensive materials, which is mostly the indium and, the, and the silver. So we want to develop new whole transport layers, indium free transmit conductive oxides. Uh, we, we will apply copper metallization and also use a um, polymer-based interconnection with much less silver consumption for the, for the modules. The next slide, please. Um, here you can see in detail our, our different uh, topics at which we want to work on uh, for the, from the layer stack and as well on, on, on the metallization part. At, at the end, we want to have a low-cost technology for cells and modules with a power conversion efficiency of above 25% on, on the cell level. And those cells, we will have then two approaches. One is to apply this in a, in a tandem solar cell with a perovskite top cell with efficiencies above 30%. And we also want to develop then modules from, from those cells with an output power of um, 335 watt for a 60 cell module. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Carsten. Thank you. Thank you. Moving forward, Smart Mooring, Eza, up to you. No, sorry, it's Cisnake. Miliano, are you with us? Yeah, you know? please. Yeah, yeah. We we look. Can you see me also now? I don't know. Anyhow, uh, so we coordinate the Sea Snake Plus. Uh, from the name, you can see it's a continuation from the Ocean Aeronet Sea Snake, which was about the the, the medium voltage cables, so dynamic cables. Um, for the this application is for um, different marine energy could be both tidal and wave, but also can be applicated also in uh, fish farming, actually. So it's, um, it's a dynamic cable in the marine sector for the blue economy, especially for the, for the blue energy. Uh, the consortium is, as you can see here, from Sweden down to, to Italy, Spain, France, and, uh, and Ireland. And it's 12 different um, partners. And uh, we at RISE in Sweden, we do coordinate. And then we have four partners in Sweden. Four in Italy, two in France, one one in Spain, and one in uh, in Ireland. Ireland. Uh, yeah. What is this snake? It's about uh, taking up and uh, introduce more um, upscalability for this. Kind Ten of seconds cable. to go. 
yeah. So cable with uh, environmental uh, impact uh, monitoring for mechanical damage and uh, um, improved protection for biofouling so that the biofouling will not in, will not uh, um, uh, damage more the cable. So the, it's about uh, what we did in Seasnake, but implemented with a better machine and better and better upscalability for having cable ready for the blue economy. Wonderful. Uh, wonderful, Emiliano. Now I call Eza to present Smart Mooring. Excellent, thank you. So you can maybe change the slide. So Smart Mooring project. So many offshore systems rely on mooring components. So these are wires or, or other components that anchor to the seabed or to other structures. In some systems, for example, some tidal and wave converters, the mooring components do more than just anchor. They are essential parts of the energy converters. So smart mooring will develop and demonstrate real-time mapping of load, shape, mechanical state, and temperature inside and along the mooring components. So we do that by integrating fiber optics into the components. Uh, and we use, then use these fibers as sensors. Uh, we have two use cases, uh, the tidal energy system from Minesto and a wave energy converter system from Core Power Ocean. Uh, and the project also includes rise from Sweden, uh, universities of Eiffel in Valencia, from France and Spain, and the sensor company Carlsons in Spain. So in two years, we will show that smart mooring components can uh, enable in-operation optimizations of energy converters, uh, data-driven design of mooring components, safer operations and predictive maintenance, and the an overall lower cost of ownership of these, these systems. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Aza. Uh, sorry, we had to move really fast. And now spot it, Francesca Brunetti, University of Torino. Florizio, not Vergata, oh, sorry. Vergata, yes. <laughs> so uh, thanks a lot. Next uh, slide, please. So the concept uh, of our project uh, is uh, to concentrate uh, on uh, flexible photovoltaics uh, for uh, indoor application. Uh, so typically, uh, like uh, the power of devices uh, that uh, are uh, used for IoT application uh, range uh, in uh, the um, ever range between a microwatt and milliwatt. So what uh, we will do through our uh, project, uh, to the Spotted project, is uh, to adapt uh, the flexible photovoltaic tandem uh, system to the spectra of a typical indoor lighting that we can see in the slide uh, that is quite different from the normal uh, sun uh, spectra. Um, in the project, uh, what we will uh, use is uh, the combination of a perovskite uh, solar cell plus an organic solar cell, as uh, we can see in the image below. And uh, thanks to this combination, we will cover uh, all the spectra of the normal LED illumination and gather the power out from this uh, uh, device. And uh, next few 10 seconds. Please. Yes. That's the consortium. Uh, so we have like a uh, uh, partner from Italy, Finland, Denmark, and Spain, companies and university that will deal with the whole activities of the project. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Francesca. Now it's eternal sound. Flower, Alexander Fusel from the Fraunhofer. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. The Sunflower Project will deal with the sustainable neonatri fabrication of low environmental impact receiver materials. And on the next slide, we can see how the consortium is built up from seven partners of four, Euro four European countries. This is Amazement from Poland, Alborg CSP from Denmark, the two institutions, CMA PSA and Fundacion Sener from Spain. And we have the German company, ASK, SEC, GmbH, and the two Fraunhofer Institutes, IFAM and IKTS. And we are addressing the challenge to making available cheap and durable high temperature absorber materials for the concentrated solar power open volume receiver technology with low environmental impact by the integration of the absorber improvement with adjusted design raw material preparation fabrication experimental and experimental and numerical assessment and on the next slide we will see that we uh, will cover the whole process chain from the raw material um, preparation over the design the material development the fabrication and the application so we expect an increased efficiency of the absorber structures with higher durability for two temperature levels a metal one and a 
ceramic one, reduce preparation costs and low environmental impact and strengthening the CSP as competitive part of clean energy source. And from the network, we expect uh, new connections to CSP partners and other applications for our high temperature materials. Thanks a lot, Juan. Uh, yes, I'm also here. Thanks a lot. So um, we are a consortium on the next slide um, from different parts of Europe. So going from south to north, we have from Turkey, Gunam and Smart Solar. In Germany, it's uh, front of ISE and Schmidt. In Ireland, Mainz Photovoltaics and in Norway, Norsan. And we're also covering a quite a large part of the value chain in our project. We're going from wafer to module. So we are looking at high quality, large P-type silicon wafers. So we are, say, on the old fashioned silicon photovoltaics, but it's the working horse in the energy transition, let's say. Um, and we're working on high efficiency top core solar cells. This is like the next generation after Topcon that we're uh, uh, looking at. And this is based on P-type wafers again, uh, because they are a lot cheaper than N-type wafers. We believe that they can be a very important part of the, of the next generation. And also um, they, they can allow even higher efficiencies than N-type if you do it well. And we would uh, look into that technology uh, with uh, improved solar modules and also auto testing to uh, look at this is really working in the field. On the next slide, uh, we see also some more aspects of this work that we'll be going Ten for. Seconds. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so maybe one thing to uh, emphasize is that 10% of lower solar cell production costs we're emphasizing here. And yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks, Mark. Uh, now, Rachel Plus, uh, uh, Ryzen and um, Pierre Ingmarsson, if you're there, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Many thanks for, for, for being able to present WECO Plus, which stands for Sustainable Concrete Material, leading to improved substructure for offshore renewable energy technologies. You can change slide, please. So the consortia is uh, quite spread uh, across Europe, in, uh, in Germany, in the Netherlands, Sweden, Ireland and Spain. Uh, you can see we marked it down in the Canary Islands, so it belongs to Spain. So we're focusing on uh, new sustainable uh, circular and reliable concrete materials as we've seen the, the fluctuation on other materials in the offshore industry uh, regarding uh, metal, for example. So we have three user cases uh, applying these uh, technologies uh, or this material, this uh, Carnegie. Uh, from Ireland, and we have uh, ocean harvesting from Sweden, and we have solar duct from the Netherlands. Um, you can change the, um, the presentation. Uh, so the overall outcome of the WECO Plus project is that we're going to focus on the, uh, the to minimize the environmental impact, uh, increase the economic viability on the LCU, reducing the LCUE, and in the industrialization, the scale up of these. And the, the main focus is uh, on local production. So we can uh, we can produce these anywhere across Europe. Thanks. Many thanks. Thanks, Pierre. And now we are coming to the end. Wind DG Power, Paolo Mattabelli, representing Chalmers University. Floor is yours. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you. And uh, so this project is related to the analysis of uh, offshore wind power architecture in terms of control and power electronics based on communication and estimation. The team is based on uh, coordinated by Chalmers and the University of uh, Padova. UPC Spain and then for industrial partner, which is DND touch and mainly wind. Next, please. So the, the major goal is to <clears throat> understand different possible architecture for uh, offshore wind power and also taking account the energy storage requirement. The innovative part is to develop uh, sensing and identification and communication technique able to understand different conditions and then to develop innovative converter control for different architecture. One could be the DC. Architecture reported here. The next one is going to be represented with uh, AAC representation with the goal of increasing the length of AC transmission system based on this communication and estimation technology. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paolo. Wonderful timing. Now we we have arrived to the end of our session uh, with some delay. I beg your pardon, and I leave the floor to the following session. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Raquel and Francesco. Uh, then, 
it's time for us to continue on to the to the next challenge. Uh, do we have Agie Stagelan and Isabel Cabrita? Uh, floor is yours. Yes, hello. <laughs> we are ready to move on with the next challenge, number three. That's enabling climate neutrality with uh, storage technologies, renewable fuels, and CCUS. Uh, can you have the next uh, slide, please? And uh, first of all, very brief about the ambition with, the, with this challenge. We hope to facilitate the emergence of uh, CCUS technology through targeted financing of innovation and research activities. Uh, and on the second bullet here, the, the same for, for hydrogen and renewable fuels. We hope to facilitate the development and adaption of technologies for production, transport, storage and end use of hydrogen and renewable fuels. And we also would like to accelerate the time to market for hydrogen and renewable fuels. And um, within this uh, challenge, TRI number three, we have 15 new projects. That's quite a lot. And we are not able to present every, every project in details within only 20 minutes. So uh, we will have a pitch with one of the projects. And then after that, we will briefly mention the other new projects. And uh, if I can have the next slide, please. I would like to welcome uh, Peter Van Oos from TNO. He is the project manager in the DRIVE project. Uh, Peter, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Uh, I had some troubles connecting, but I made it. So uh, can you hear yes. me? Yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. That's really good. Uh, do you have your camera on? Yes. Yes. And uh, yeah. now I can see you. Very good to see you again. Yes, and uh, I, I'm very happy to have you on board here today because we will have a brief uh, picture to figure out what the drive project is all about. But before that, uh, I have a few questions for you. And uh, in this session, we focus on CCUS hydrogen and renewable fuels. And in your opinion, as an experienced project manager within research, how important are these technologies for reaching climate targets? Yeah, I think they are very important. Uh, we need to make this, uh, this energy transitions to renewables. Um, and I think hydrogen as well uh, is, is very important. Uh, and re and uh, synthetic fuels, of course, also very important. But they are still in the beginning of the development chain, I would say. And CCUS is a lot further. Yeah. And I really see CCUS as a transition technology that will be there for maybe for the next 20, 30 years um, to take CO2 out of the atmosphere uh, and to beat the climate change. And then, yeah, gradually we will uh, step over to hydrogen and renewable fuels, hopefully. Um, so, but there's still a lot to do in CCUS. Uh, so we am very happy that we get the opportunity to uh, develop this technology further. Yeah, very good. Yeah. I was hoping that you should say that these are important technologies, so that's good. Uh, but but how important is research and innovation? Um, I think it's very important to continue. Uh, as some people say, okay, uh, carbon capture is a developed technology. We can just implement it and implementations are ongoing. But we also see that people who are implementing uh, CO2 capture on a big scale um, they are still facing challenges uh, regarding solvent degradation and emissions. And I think we should continue the research on that part also to, uh, yeah, to make the technology more sustainable and also in the end also more cheaper for the, for the cost of ownership, I think should also go down uh, in that respect. Mm. That, that's good to hear. Uh, you have been the project manager and a principal uh, researcher in many previous Airnet Coven projects. Uh, could, could you tell me a little bit on what you have been doing in earlier projects and how this have uh, taken you all the way forward to drive and 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 fi finally say a few words about the drive projects what what is it all about and what will you do yes i've been uh, in this uh, development family for many years already uh, i was a coordinator in the first uh, x program uh, back in uh, 2017, 2018, the Align project, a very broad project, very big project with many partners. Um, the year after, or two years after that, we, uh, we, uh, I was the coordinator of the launch project. And then also the consortium uh, and the, the member countries grew. Uh, the more member countries, US joined, uh, Canada joined. And um, yeah, what I really enjoy about this project is that uh, well, we can actually work uh, worldwide and more and more countries are uh, are joining and yeah see you took 
beating sea to capture and beating climate change is an international uh, international problem. It doesn't stop at the border. It also doesn't stop at the border of Europe. So I'm really happy that we can uh, yeah work together in an international way and really collect the, the the best brains in the in the business to solve the problems that we are facing. Um, and now for CTP, it's drive indeed. And in drive, we want to look at uh, deep removal of CO2. Um, in the over the last 10, 20 years, uh, we always targeted for 90% uh, removal of CO2. Um, and that was a kind of artificial uh, limit, I think, because uh, te technology-wise, we can go much further. And that those that ambition is now uh, coming up. And we want to really go to 99.99% uh, CO2 capture of the flue gas stream. And if we can go that far, we can also capture the CO2 from the uh, combustion air. Uh, this is 400 ppm, which is in the air. If we also can capture at least part of that, then we don't, don't only uh, take out the CO2 from the point source, but we also do actually air capture in the same installation. And yeah. Direct air capture is still also under development. Uh, the costs are at nowadays still really high. So if we can make a first step in the deep removal to integrate direct air capture in more or less standard CO2 capture plants, that would be, I think, really beneficial. So in drive, we're going to look at uh, if that is possible and also look at the cost of it. And next to that, we want to look at electrification of CO2 stripping. Uh, so you need to heat up the capture solvent to release the CO2. If we can partly electrify this and use renewable energy for this, I think then also the technology in itself will become more sustainable. So we work on two different technologies in drive. And one of these technologies will also be taken further to a demonstration at the cement plant of Semex in the Czech Republic. So it's development, quite low TRL development, but we want to go to a demonstration phase uh, on the real site with real flue gas. Mm -hmm. This is really interesting. Uh, until now, I have heard many researchers and many companies uh, saying that it's only uh, economically feasible to capture 90 to 95 percent of the CO2 from uh, from flue gas, because the last 5 percent, getting all the way up to 100 or 99.9, .9 will be too expensive. But you are saying now that you have a concept that makes it uh, economically feasible to capture 99.9% of the CO2, is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, we still need to prove it, of course. Uh, yeah. But yeah, the proposal is set up in such a way that we can research this. Um, with this electrification technology, we try to take out the last part of it. Uh, and that is the new aspect of drive. And uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, I think we have a very strong consortium also uh, in, into uh, quite some European countries, hmm. uh, with also a lot of uh, industrial support. Um, so I think we really have to put together the right partners to, uh, to put up this challenge and to see if we can uh, get even so far that we can uh, do duck on a point source. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This sounds like a very good idea. So I'm uh, I'm looking forward to follow this project. Yes. And uh, we, we we hope to see you again in let's say a year and presenting some research for us. That would that would be good. Yeah, so you know, you know that I always love this uh, knowledge workshops that the ECFAS organizing. Uh, we were in Paris a few weeks ago. I think that's really inspiring. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the next uh, CTP yearly conference where we can uh, hopefully present some yeah. first results. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're saying that uh, be because that is something else I have on my mind. We have now 15 new projects within CCUS hydrogen and renewable fuels. Uh, how can we bring these projects together to, to get synergies, to get the project to learn from each other? What what, what should uh, we from CDP do to make the projects work together in, a, in an efficient way? Um, yeah, I think ACT has also a really nice website. So I think uh, to publish the the projects on, on the website with, uh, with the, uh, the context of the coordinators, to see uh, with a short, maybe a short description where the project is about, I think we can yeah, easily through the website can discover synergies between the between the projects, and I think it's also good then that, that the coordinators contact each other mm. to see yeah where there's overlap and where we can learn from each other. Uh, because I think that's really uh, a very positive aspect uh, of the ACT project in the past that we really got together. It was a bit like a family, right? Everybody knew each other and everybody yeah communicated with each other and made the best out of the project. And I think yeah, one plus one can then make three, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. 
Good, good, good to hear. Um, I would also like to hear from you. What is the advantage of a platform like CTP? Uh, is this helpful for for making the research and innovation more more efficient and fruitful? And uh, and do you have any advices to you? How how can we do in the future and upcoming calls? Uh, what what can we do to to help the researchers to to be as efficient as possible? Um, yeah, what I like about CTP and ACT calls is that. Uh... You're, you have a kind of freedom to uh, to define your project and also the topic of the projects. Uh, that means you can really bring strong aspects of every project together to make a, a very good proposal. Yeah. Um, I think the proposal uh, portal from a CTP was was quite good in the first uh, yeah. first stage. I sometimes have some trouble uh, that that we were kicked out of the portal, but I think that has been solved. Or, uh, everything has been solved. Yep. Yeah. And. Yeah, what I'm a, as a project manager submitting proposals, uh, when I submitted the full proposal of uh, CTP, I was waiting for a kind of uh, confirming email that we had submitted a proposal, but that didn't come. And in ACT, that was always uh, coming uh, after a few minutes, you get an email, you've submitted your proposal successfully. Yeah. So then I always get a bit scared. Okay, did everything go well? <laughs> you know, yeah. is it is it okay? And then they send an email to the CTP and then they immediately answered, okay, your proposal is uh, received yeah. and we will evaluate it. Uh, yeah. But that's always a bit of a scary phase when you're in, in the last moment submitting a proposal that you don't get a confirmation email that actually uh, your proposal was submitted. So maybe that's uh, something to look into for the next uh, for the next round, I would say. Yeah, th th thank you for sharing these thoughts. Uh, this this was our first call within CTP, and uh, we we are still learning. So uh, this will hopefully be be better next time. But but yeah, thank but you for, yeah. for sharing. Yeah, but filling in all the partner information, the budget, I think that went there. That worked really well, I think. Yeah, good. That good. Sense I was, uh, it was good. a very positive experience. Mm. That's uh, that's good to hear. Um, in, in CTP, we have a new call out now, and uh, we probably have many participants today that are uh, working on an application. As an experienced uh, project uh, manager, what will be your single most important advice to everybody who would like to submit an application? I think the, the consortium that you put together is key. Uh, and you should really look for partners who can really make a contribution to your proposal and really have a very clear role in your project also uh, and a significant role. Um, and um, yeah, it's always hard work to put together a proposal, of course. Uh, so I also encourage all the partners always to contribute, to review, to be critical. Um, I always say, yeah, when you have a proposal and it's only, yeah, and CTP was only not, also not a very big proposal, right? Yep. And the number of pages was limited. Yep. So then, and then every word in the proposal should be the good word. Yep. Uh, so you should really focus on what has been asked in the proposal text. Um, concerning impact, concerning the implementation, things like that. And I think, yeah, you really have to be critical that every word in the proposal is relevant for your work that you are going to do. Hmm. Thank you very much. We we, we will uh, wrap uh, this pitch up uh, very soon and uh, I will shortly present the other projects. So uh, thank you very much for, for joining us, uh, Peter. This was uh, really appreciated and I'm looking forward to follow your project. Thank yeah, you. You're welcome, Agar. Uh, it was nice to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice talking okay. to you. Thank you. So can I have the next uh, slide, please? Uh, this is a list of the 10 new projects within uh, CCUS. I will briefly mention each of them. And uh, after that, my colleague uh, Isabel will uh, briefly present the projects within hydrogen and renewable fuels. But if we start from the top of the list, we have a cloud advancing chemical looping combustion of domestic fuels. And the coordinator is uh, Chalmers from Sweden. This is a very interesting project that will look on a new and promise, well, it's not new, it's a promising technology for capturing CO2, the chemical looping combustion. And uh, they, they will advance this technology and this could easily be the, the future or the next uh, generation technology for CO2 capture, very interesting project. The same for the next one called A Cloud. Uh, the name called, the next one is AMPCS, sorry. And uh, this is from uh, a small company called Aqualon Carbon Capture. They will look at the membrane-based solutions for CO2 capture on uh, ships. And uh, yeah, ships, they, they emit a lot of CO2 and capturing CO2 on ships is really 
important. So that is also interesting. Next one is uh, bugs. Brine utilization for CO2 to be solidified and stored from, um, and the coordinator is from Italy, Sapienza. And this project will look on uh, the possibilities for mineralization of CO2. And if I remember correctly, using the CO2 in concrete. So this is also a very interesting uh, technology, promising. Next one, CO2 RR. And uh, here the coordinator is uh, South Pole from Switzerland. And uh, they, will, uh, they will in fact establish a first commercial international CO2 transport and value chain in Europe. This is really interesting. They are partner from Switzerland, France and Norway, and we look on possibilities for capturing CO2 in one country, transporting it and storing it in another country. And that is that kind of infrastructure is really something we need. The next one, uh, CTS, we are, we are back to ships again. This is from Norse in Norway as the coordinator. They will look at CO2 transport and storage directly from a ship and, uh, and into offshore storage. And this, uh, this will uh, make the CO2 transport and injection more efficiently. So that is also interesting. Next one in, is drive. And we heard everything about that from Peter Van Oes. Then we have a Greensmith, uh, that is a project led by TNO, and they will look at uh, steel making, and uh, they will look into gas processing and uh, look at process that can make, uh, uh, that can make sure that steel can be produ produced cost efficiently with low CO2 footprint. Also very interesting. Then we have a Legacy uh, with a coordinator from Sintef. They will study uh, wells for CO2 injection and also uh, site geology for CO2 storage. And uh, de-risking uh, wells for CO2 injection is really important to make sure that we can, uh, can store the CO2 efficiently. Ramonko is the next one with a coordinator from NORS in Norway. They will look at uh, CO2 monitoring technologies. When you store the CO2, you need to have good technologies for monitoring the CO2 and showing that it's in place in the storage site. And the last one, Sensation with a coordinator from Sintef. They will look at the CO2 capture from sources with low CO2 concentration. And Peter mentioned that earlier, could be air capture could be a CO2 capture from industrial sites with low CO2 concentration. And this is also something that we really need. And then I hand over to you, Isabel, to present uh, the new projects on hydrogen and renewable fuels in the next slide. Thank you. And Isabel, please. Isabel, I cannot hear you. Have you unmuted? Sorry, thank you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I represent here the Science and Technology Foundation in Portugal. Uh, the, I would like to start by saying that the five projects that we have through the 2022 call, they all focus on hydrogen. Uh, we didn't uh, receive uh, on uh, synthetic fuels or other renewable fuels, uh, which is uh, which we hope this in 2023 we'll get some submissions. I I will give a brief overview of uh, these uh, five. I start with Opla. Uh, is coordinated by uh, Zen. I hope. <laughs> said it correctly. And this is um, uh, by Czechnia. And uh, the, the project uh, uh, focus on the effect of uh, hydrogen in uh, when introduced in pipelines and storage units and uh, the materials uh, degradation, uh, the quality of the materials, uh, which has to do with the uh, durability properties. And uh, the partners involved are from Czechia, Germany and Italy. Then we have the project HICOM. Uh, 
and this project uh, has to do with uh, equipment to be installed in uh, construction and mining machineries in using a fuel cell with a high performance uh, battery and uh, it will be testing these equipments uh, the, in real conditions and is coordinated by Fraunhofer Germany and has partners from Germany, Austria and Switzerland. Then we have Hydrotech, which I found quite interesting, uh, focus on hydrogen production using solar thermal technology associated with OTEC technology, which is a, a ocean uh using the gradient of temperature between the sea surface and the seabed and in the case of uh, mediterranean and where they are going to uh, focus the project the temperature difference is uh, quite low so they uh, instead of producing electricity they produce hydrogen and they get in addition desalinated water this is uh, uh, coordinated by Cyprus University of Technology and also has partners from Greece and Spain. Then we have a high life that focus on underground storage of uh, hydrogen, looking into the potential of microbial reactions to uh, occur and this will influence the site uh, selection is uh, coordinated by NORS uh, and the partners are from Germany, Norway, France, Czechia, United States of America, Netherlands and United Kingdom. And then the last one, Unicorn, focuses on uh, electrolysis for hydrogen production using next generation proton exchange membranes uh, to improve hydrogen yields and uh, have uh, electrolyzers with lower cost. And they aim at uh, building a 40 kilowatt electrolyzer. It's uh, coordinated by SINTEF and uh, the partners in Norway and the partners besides Norway come from Canada, Germany, Sweden and France. And basically it's this which is quite interesting because we get uh, all the areas which we uh, added in the call from the production uh, transportation, storage, and end use of hydrogen. And this is it. Thank you. Okay, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Uh, we are running out of time, so uh, I skip my last slide and we head back to the moderators and, and the next uh, TRIs. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Aga. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, now we will go on to the next challenge, uh, number four. Uh, where we have efficient zero emission heating and cooling solutions. Gerdi, are you here? Uh, yes, Robert I'm here. And Alicia, welcome. The floor is yours. Welcome. Um, good morning to all of you. Uh, my name is Gerdi Breenbroek uh, from uh, the TRI for heating and cooling. Uh, the TRI4 is uh, one of the technology-oriented uh, transition initiatives of the Clean Energy Transition Partnership, uh, which are, uh, well, us heating and cooling, the TRI2 uh, related to power technologies and the TRI3 related to CCUS and fuels. So this is a nice um, representation of everything of the whole energy system and we are working on heating and cooling. Why heating and cooling? Uh, because 50% of our energy consumption is for heating. Uh, it's for heating buildings, it's for heating industry and uh, we're talking there about uh, the European uh, energy demand and another important uh, thing to realize is that this um, that this demand is mostly in winter. So in winter we have a peak in demand, 
which we need to uh, address when we want to be 100% climate neutral in 2050 as Europe. And that's why we are using, uh, renew uh, we are focusing on renewable heating, renewable cooling, but also uh, thermal storage technologies, which need to be part of the solution uh, that we're uh, working on uh, for uh, Europe. So as a TRI, we're issuing calls uh, which aim for that 100% climate neutral heating and cooling uh, technologies for all major parts of Europe. Uh, and we are covering the whole chain we're from sources, including storage systems, uh, including conversion systems, and including distribution. And today we have with us the four selected projects that were, uh, that were selected from the 2022 call. Uh, and uh, we're going to the next slide, but they're with us and they will introduce the project. So I'm only um, introducing them to you shortly because they will do it better themselves. Uh, we have the strawberries project that will um, uh, that will explain uh, what strawberries have to do with solar thermal agriculture. Uh, we have the LAC DHC project that is looking into uh, large scale uh, energy geostructures. We have the training project looking into thermal energy storage and digitization, and we have the uh, PVT for EU project, uh, which is looking into the various uses of uh, and the various uh, ways to to uh, to include photovoltaic thermal uh, technology uh, into the energy system. Uh, we will we have four projects, so it's uh, doable in 20 minutes. Uh, and I give the floor to the first project, which is strawberries. Uh, we have with us. Thorsten Zum from the Technical uh, Hochschule in Ingolstadt. Uh, Thorsten, uh, the floor is yours to tell us all about uh, the Strawberries project. And if you're running out of time, you have three minutes, I'll uh, give you a hint. Okay, thank you very much. So we're dealing with uh, solar thermal technology here. And on the next slide, I would like to introduce you to the project team. So my name is Thorsten Sum. I work for the Institute of New Energy Systems at Technische Hochschule Ingolstadt and Professor Wilfried Zerner will be the principal investigator for this project, coordinating the partners that we see here, including uh, Citrin Solar, a German SME who is producing uh, solar thermal collectors and thermal storages, BEG um, in Strobenhausen, a, a cooperative which is dealing with many implementation projects on renewables, Mary Aura Energy or former Savo Solar um, as a Finnish partner and um, solar thermal collector producing company and Saloy, also a Finnish SME for uh, insulating glass production. And as a last academic partner, we have the physics department from University of Minho. And um, the challenge I would uh, that we address in this project um, is on the next slide. So we see that there is an increased competition for land, and especially when we consider large scale solar projects, such as on the left side, um, we saw that this hinders planners, municipalities, system providers to install more because it's hard to find suitable land. And for PV, there's already a nice solution for this, um, which we see on the right. The vertical bifacial modules um, offer multiple land use, combining agricultural use and energetic use. And, and thus reducing the land footprint. But we also saw that currently there's no uh, heating technology that uh, effectively can achieve this. So uh, the approach that we'd like to take is um, also see on the next slide. Um, we came up with an interesting new approach of designing solar thermal collectors, uh, which is combining the insulating glass production with the design principle of flat plate collectors. And this gives us a, a collector which is um, made of glass mainly. And uh, while investigating on a previous research project, we identified that this is perfectly suited for bifacial use. So um, within this project, Strawberries, we enhanced the technology further and to some further investigations to allow for bifacial operation of these solar thermal modules. And um, what we expect is that they can provide a te technological solution to the described problem of land scarcity 
and also efficiently provide renewable heat and, and thus conserve the landscape by having an agri solar thermal solution or system. And uh, we hope that we can increase the land use efficiency significantly and thus also reduce the land footprint that is required for solar thermal at this, at this time. And yeah, I'm happy to discuss afterwards. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. And yeah, thank you very much. I think that your contract details are also in the next slide. Thank you very much. Uh, it's also a, a very nice collaboration, I think, uh, between the academia and the industry here. Uh, so I encourage you to, uh, to contact this project if you're interested. And then uh, we thank uh, Strawberries and we move on to the next project, which is the LAG DHC project, which is led from the University of Lille in France. And uh, Hussein Mruk is, uh, is with us. Um, Hussein, please uh, take Thank the floor. You. Do you and... hear me? Yes. Yes, perfect. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jerdy. Yes, please. N next slide. May... Uh, thank... Next slide, please. Yes, so uh, my name is Hussein Roy, as you introduced me, thank you, from the University of Lille in France, from the uh, Laboratory of Civil Engineering and Geo Environment. Uh, just to let you know that our project we, uh, will aim to, to introduce what we call energy geostructures, that means that we are uh, mainly focusing on some uh, solution provide, provided by uh, civil engineering uh, uh, systems. Which are which we uh, which are called uh, uh, geostructures. Our partnership is composed by uh, sixteen partners from six countries that are uh, plotted uh, just there. Please next slide. Uh, oh yes, Ooh. sorry. Uh, there was a kind of you know uh, animation, yeah. but we lost it. Uh, don't worry, it's it's not it's not a problem. Um, the challenge we are tackling uh, with is about energy geostructures. What, what is energy geostructures? Energy geostructures, as you can see here in, in some of this picture, is the, is the, uh, the a solution where we could uh, uh, implement within the geostructure uh, a promising solution for smart integration uh, of uh, heat transfer. So this, uh, this energy geostructures have therefore a dual role. First of, uh, first of all, for sure, a structural function as they are aimed to, uh, to ensure the, 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 uh, the, 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 the stability of, uh, of the infrastructures uh, uh, of what uh, the, this uh, energy, this uh, geostructures. And also by integrating these uh, uh, tubes where we could circulate uh, uh, fluids, uh, no, another role, which is the heat transfer. So it, this, uh, this, uh, this solution confers to the system a cost-effective shallow geothermal uh, energy solution and also a, a low carbon footprint as we do not uh, create new systems for heating and cooling, but we use the fact that these, in, these geostructures are implemented and we take benefits from this to exchange thermal power from the soil or with the soil and the structures. So uh, from the technical part, this is a relatively uh, mature technology, but there are still some barriers uh, to the dissemination in, of, uh, uh, of this technology. And this is the main uh, objective of our project, dissemination in terms, in terms of impacting uh, the, prof the professional practice, uh, mainly due to the absence of uh, some well-documented case studies and also lack of awareness, lack of European legal framework and standard, standardization procedures. All these barriers have need to be uh, overcome uh, by our project. Mm -hmm. um, so the planned research activity is aimed in, the, in this case, is aimed to uh, at creating a high added uh, value, mainly in terms of scientific, but also in terms of social and economic outcomes uh, with a particular reference to the issues of green transition, the possibility of contributing to the development of innovative building technologies with a, with a reduced impact on the environment, as I told you. Uh, moreover, uh, our project like DHT Can you wrap it up? aims at uh, providing renewable solutions at affordable cost for heating and cooling, uh, which uh, therefore has the potential to open a new market with a very high potential. 
uh, we also take benefit from a mature uh, cooperation within the framework of a cost action named foliage that I'm also chairing to uh, to uh, to create this to to use uh, the benefits from this partnership by combining this, the, the the various specialties involved in such pro project. Next mm -hmm. slide, please. Yes, please be quick, uh, because yes, otherwise we're running out of time. The, mainly the solution that we will uh, aim to provide from from our uh, uh, project. I um, I try to follow the template. In fact, I I receive so. Uh, I just uh, give you an overview of, of the main solutions. Next, and maybe it's finished. Next, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. It's finished. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for introducing this interesting project to us, where the, the concrete is really uh, used to, uh, to, to, well, to, uh, to all its potential. Let me put it like that. Um, thank you. Thank you. And uh, with that, uh, I want to invite uh, the next project, uh, uh, which is led by uh, the NTU Trondheim Technical University. And we have here Natasha Nord, uh, we, who will be introducing the training project uh, again on storage technologies. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I will present uh, this, this project. Uh, training stand uh, for uh, use, uh, uh, increased use of thermal storaging by higher implementation or actually harvesting more benefits from, from digital technologies because we want to show that district heating can be uh, completely renewable and resource efficient. So, so you can go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, my name is Natasha Noor and I'm a professor uh, here at the Department of Energy and Process Engineering and uh, we are a group of uh, here are presented all the partners uh, from three countries. They are either, uh, we have representative from research like NTNU, Hojskula i Dalarna and uh, Fraunhofer, but also we have representatives from industry. Uh, companies Utilifeed and Smart Place are dealing with uh, digitalization for either energy efficiency or improvement in district heating. So they are really into the business and interested in this. While Aspan Viak is dealing with geothermal energy, the colleagues uh, that are with us, and Noshkenashi is really dealing with uh, district heating. So you can go to the next one. Uh, yeah, what we find out is a problem that uh, buildings and district heating infrastructure has um, assets that we can store heat into this or utilize this in a best way to avoid peak loads and in that way remove fossil fuels. Also, this can be used uh, to, to, ut to extend use of district heating and also uh, decrease sizes or utilize better for, to actually increase capacity with the same size. And there is also one new idea, use of district heating for sector coupling, but because we have more EVs and uh, EVs may use PV, but this interaction and when we have waste heat, can be given to district heating. So, so this is uh, what we find as a challenge that we want to deal with. And to tackle all this, we will use uh, lots of, uh, develop lots of strategies and uh, controls by using the last development in machine learning and combination of physical models and data driven. Thanks that we have companies that are actually developing these solutions, uh, we, we are targeting to have big replicability. Also, these design companies, they will, whatever they get from this project, implement in many other projects. So you can go to the next one. Uh, yeah, what is solutions that we are, will use? Uh, we want in the, at the same time uh, to optimize load by knowing, uh, by having building data and detailed monitoring on buildings. We will make load forecasting and by having uh, price signals, we will optimize demand. And by, by knowing this demand, we will utilize this uh, available flexibility and storing in the system. And this storage in within the project, we will focus on a few things. This is storage in building mass, storage in pipes, storage in water, and also in ground. So, so we, we also have case study with uh, seasonal storage. Uh, so we will use different uh, solutions 
uh, IoT solutions and machine learning to make these optimizations. So what uh, we see still as untapped potential within this area is uh, that through, through developing these small logics and using uh, these digital tools, we can uh, really intensify lots of cost-effective energy efficiency measures in buildings, but also industry heating that are needed for better utilization of thermal storage. So, so this is what we will deal with. And on the last, you have my contacts. Yeah, and I will be available for any yeah, comments, question, or uh, yeah, collaborations. Thank you very much, Natasha. That was uh, nice and to the point, uh, and also uh, interesting to see the the, the similarities and the the, the uh, in the approach uh, in the LAC DHC and the training project using uh, masses uh, to store heat. Um, and now uh, we're going going to solar. Uh, technology again, uh, but looking at uh, different ways to use it to uh, to most effective, uh, if I can say it like that. But Ivan um, from uh, MG Sustainable en Engineering in Sweden, you can for sure explain this much better. Ivan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jordi. Uh, yes, this is Ivan Acosta. I am the project manager of the project of PBT for EU. As Gordy mentioned, we're going to be um, um, approaching uh, photovoltaic thermal uh, technologies. And if we can go to the next uh, slide. Uh, yes, and the project is going to be consisting of uh, six partners from three different countries. We have three industrial partners, such as uh, MG Sustainable Engineering, which is going to be the coordinator of the project, uh, Solar Peak, which is a technology developer, uh, as well as Solaris Renewables AB. And from the academic and research institutions, we have the University of Yavle, we have uh, a DTU in Denmark and Lanek in, in, in Portugal. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, what we're planning to tackle, uh, we know that uh, for the PV part, we have a low energy conversion efficiency uh, that can be up to 25% in the best uh, case scenario in commercial applications. Uh, also that PV panels lower their efficiency with temperature. And, and, and we know that PVT technologies are already available in the market. Nevertheless, they, they have been limited to residential applications. And in the project, we're aiming to, uh, um, I don't know, to increase the, the approach of these type of technologies. And, and also uh, to reduce the complexity that solar thermal systems can have, uh, because this could be actually a, a big barrier in comparison with PV uh, technologies. We can go to the next slide. And what we're proposing is to develop uh, and, and test high efficiency and cost uh, effective renewable energy technologies uh, based on hybrid PVT collectors uh, integrated with another renewable energy sources or systems such as heat pumps and absorption chillers. Uh, and specifically, we're going to be aiming to develop uh, one uh, PVT collector that is going to be in the range of uh, 20 to 140 degrees and also uh, a PV panel retrofit uh, that is going to be working uh, on PV panels or conventional PV panels. And we're going to be also developing intelligent control systems and um, considering as well what is going to be the final application of both technologies. Uh, for example, trust trading uh, and, and also uh, absorption chillers and, and other applications depending also on the temperature range that we're going to be uh, approaching with uh, each of the technology that we're going to be developing. Uh, to that end, uh, we are going to be also um, approaching different collector level and system level developments, such as uh, spectral splitting for the PVT uh, that is going to be um, um, approaching 140 degrees, and also uh, other heat transfer, heat transfer um, enhancements that would allow us to increase the efficiency of the PVT collectors and, and also the, uh, well, the thermal and, and the electrical. And yeah, and that's part, uh, particularly uh, what is the, the project about. And then on the next slide, you have the contact if you have uh, any doubts or any other interest that you will have in the project. Thank you very much, Gordy. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ivan. Thank you very much, uh, all of the speakers, all of the projects uh, that you were here with us and uh, introduced us so nicely uh, into the work that you're going to do. I'm really happy to see, uh, well, let's go to the next slide. Uh, I'm really happy to see that uh, 
uh, that we have a broad range of projects dealing with uh, with with solar as a source, dealing with uh, with the underground as a source and and the storage uh, volume. Um, and we're looking forward to the results. Um, uh, and uh, these projects will also be part, become part of the CTP partnership knowledge community, so that we will have sufficient interaction and mutual learning uh, between the projects. And uh, there are opportunities for all of the audience to develop other valuable approaches to facilitate a heating and cooling transition in the 2023 call, uh, where pre-proposals have to be uh, submitted uh, on uh, the 22nd of November. You've, uh, I guess, heard about this. Uh, we have two core modules uh, this year, one for heating and cooling solutions broad and one for geothermal energy uh, technologies. So I hope that uh, we will have um, good results from these projects, but also uh, other projects, other ideas, because the energy transition is uh, too small to lean on the shoulders of these four only. Uh, so please uh, be inspired and uh, success to all of the projects. Uh, and with this, I pass it back to uh, Christina. Thank you, Gerdi. Very fascinating to hear about these projects. Now, I think it's time for a coffee break. Uh, we're running just slightly behind schedule, so we'll be on a uh, break until 11.50. So that'll give us 10 minutes for, for people to refresh their coffee, stretch their legs, and maybe uh, take powder their nose if, if they need to. So we'll be back now at, at 11.50. We'll the slide will be updated shortly. So see you then. I will uh, have interviews with uh, two very interesting people that I will present in due time. Um, so, Transition Initiative 5 on Integrated Regional Energy Systems. Um, in the call that we have, uh, which has the same name um, as the Transition Initiative, we are looking for projects that can create or strengthen local regional systems and their network of actors. And we want those projects to depart from existing needs in the region. And in order to do so, we um, strongly encourage making use of existing plans, roadmaps and regional initiatives in uh, those regions. Um, I will uh, so uh, I will start with interviewing a person who is a representative of a project that was financed uh, through a different uh, EU initiative, um, uh, and uh, that is Dmitro Romanchenko. Um, so, welcome, Dmitro. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. Hope you can hear me. We can hear you. Uh, well, excellent, and see you as well. Um, all right, so you worked with the project FlexiSync, uh, which we think is um, it was financed through another initiative, but we think that it is relevant for this TRI and uh, worked with similar um, questions. So we want to ask you some some questions about that. Uh, uh, easy, yeah. easy. Yeah, okay, great. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so would you like to start with just telling us briefly about the FlexiSync, uh, what it was about, and who was involved? Okay, so I can start presenting the project. And please stop me if you feel that I'm talking too much. So I will probably try to navigate with uh, the most important part first, but okay. let's see. Uh, okay, so the FlexiSyn project, uh, very briefly facts, uh, it was run from 2019 to 2022. We had 16 partners, four countries, six demo sites, and these countries were Sweden, Germany, Spain, and Austria. Uh, the total budget was four and a half million euros, uh, so that's more of a, a common data uh, or common uh, knowledge. 
Now the topic was the topic was on understanding how could district energy systems, mainly district heating and district cooling systems, be connected to the electricity grid or to the electricity system, and how can we uh, get value and get benefits from combining heating, cooling, and electricity together, and how we can provide more flexibility to the grid by using our heating and cooling systems more flexibly. So this will be my uh, brief answer to the first question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what would you say were the most uh, important learnings and results that you got from this project? Okay, so we had a number of work packages as we usually have, and some of them were a bit more theoretical, some of them were a bit more practical. Uh, let me briefly probably say first a bit on the research and theory part. Uh, so in a number of work packages, we studied uh, very interesting things. One would be, so imagine you have some kind of flexibility option that you think you can use it. And in case of just heating system, for example, we could use their actual network. So the pipes which carry water, they, uh, they carry hot water. So this hot water can actually be used as an energy storage. But usually information that we get about the network is like, okay, how many meters do we have the pipes? How many kilometers are the lengths? How much water in terms of cubic meters? What are the pressure? So this information is usually not very useful for optimizing energy use or energy production because it's not in terms of energy. So we usually need to transform these physical parameters into something that we can understand for operation, like what is the capacity of the network in terms of energy, like 10 gigawatts or 20 gigawatt hours, how much energy we can actually withdraw or send to the network, so store energy. And that would be in terms of kilowatts or megawatts, how much energy we will lose. So if you store energy in the network, how, how much energy we will lose from hour to hour. And we have in one of the work packages developed the method on how to identify these flexibility options, then how to characterize and most importantly, how to quantify them. So if you have a network in a specific city, we could actually transform these physical parameters into these energy parameters that we just talked about. So that is one of the results, is this methodology. Mm. The second result was also a bit theoretical, is our partners from Chalmers. They have uh, developed a method on how to uh, create future climate data sets. So when we talk about future systems, we it's an often a practice of that we use some kind of a weather conditions as of now, but weather can drastically change in the future. So we could have probably a bit more of a, uh, I don't know, climate events, which are a bit extreme, like heat waves or some cold periods. So they have developed a method on understanding how could we prognose the future weather conditions and then use these profiles and this data in order to estimate how to develop our energy system now. So how to be planned properly. So that was another more of a scientific uh, outcome. And now to a bit more of a practice, uh, I think I will explain a bit uh, what is the coolest thing for me was personally in that project is that we worked a lot with understanding how we could use buildings, which is an existing resource, and how we can use buildings as flexibility resource. So as you know, in all of the buildings, we have some kind of a threshold for indoor temperature, and that's normally 21 degrees, let's say. But we can all probably agree that if the temperature was to change from 21 to 22 or 20, it's not really a big impact on us as tenants or workers in our offices. So we have tried to estimate how can we use this indoor temperature in buildings as a flexibility resource, or we could say that this is an actually a proxy to being or using buildings as some, some type of a storage in itself. So we have achieved in this project with two of our partners, which are two um, private companies. So one of them manages smart metering and sensors on the building side. And another of them manages operation and optimization of heat generation on the district heating side. So normally these two companies operate separately. So they're 
Another company operates the district heating system and tells which units to run in which hour of the day, how much energy each of the units needs to generate. And another company normally operates the buildings, like how much energy needs to be supplied to maintain the temperature. So in this project, we actually managed to create a cloud-based platform in which the knowledge and data about the buildings could be sent through the cloud to the company that manages the operation of the district heating side. And that optimization could see buildings online on day-to-day -day basis as an energy storage. So we could co-optimize their energy demand on the building side and the supply on their generation side. So we could, we have tested in practice that info about the buildings can be sent, operation can be uh, done with, in terms of modeling, and then we could send back the signal back to the buildings so they could adjust the indoor temperature accordingly. And in this combination, we have tested that buildings could be used as a storage and contribute to lowering their heat supply uh, cost. So the district heating companies have a potential to decrease their cost, and then in the future, that will result in lower costs for the customers. So creating this link, and that was actually achieved in practice. And if I have another minute, uh, the last thing we did also was to develop energy system optimization models that also not look on their day-to-day -day operation, but that look in 20 or 30 years ahead. And we developed this and applied them to one case study in Sweden and one in Austria. And we could say, or we could make a conclusion that the or the heating at least and electricity systems, they will be more and more connected in the future because such units as for example, a CHP plant or a heat pump, they can in the first case generate electricity and heat pumps can use electricity by supplying heat. And that creates the link between the sectors. And then when we run optimization models, the models tell us that, for example, in Sweden, if we prognose that electricity prices will remain quite low because of the water resource that we have and more renewables to come, so the district heating companies will likely invest in heat pumps and that will create the link. And for the Austria, it was actually other way around. They prognose that they will have a higher electricity prices in the future. And then just the heating company in the model in Austria invested in a CHP plant hmm. to generate electricity when it's profitable. So the conclusion is that uh, conditions, local conditions can be different, but optimization modeling is a useful tool to actually study what should happen in the future. So Thank I guess you. I will stop here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was really interesting. Uh, th so if I understand you con correctly, uh, some of these solutions and results are actually implemented in yes. in real life now. Yes. Oh, that's really cool. Um, okay, we don't have that much time uh, left, but I do have one other question that uh, maybe you could answer a little bit briefly. So um, your project involved, of course, transnational collaboration. Uh, do you have any experience that you want to share that you think could be useful for people that um, are thinking of, uh, you know, making a similar project within CETP? I think I can be a bit quicker here. First of yeah. all, 2019 to 2022, that's, as you know, it's Corona time. Yeah. So we didn't really have many physical meetings. So we would suggest to us a project uh, for people who work in projects to continue using Teams, Skype, all the digital tools you can, but don't forget to physically meet from time to time because physical meetings are still better and you can cover many more, much more topics if you have a physical meeting. And one more thing that you could probably point out is that in this specific setting, we have a financier who was Aeronet program, but we also had our money through local energy agencies and they had their separate demands. Hmm. So try from the beginning of the project, try to synchronize these demands and how do you work with them? Because this might get you into some challenges later on. Okay, thank you so much. It was really interesting to hear um, what, what happened with this project. And uh, yeah, I look forward to 
keeping keeping my eyes on what happens with the results uh, further along in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting, and uh, I can share the links to all the deliverables and the project uh, web page, so you can share it with the with the attendees of this webinar. Yes, please do. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay, let's see if I can open the. Um, like now I mainly see the two of us, but I also want to see a bit more of the presentation. Um, how do I do that? Ah, yeah, okay, I see a little bit more. Thank you. Um, then I am moving on uh, quickly uh, in CETP. We um, have, as I said, um, the current uh, call module and uh, we had we are currently accepting the first uh, couple of um, uh, the first round of projects that were financed from last year and uh, so as i said in this uh, particular call module we are focused on collaboration networks in regions and making use of new technology and to solve regional and local problems. And we highly recommend that the projects in this call try out their solutions through Living Labs and make use of uh, Living Labs or Living Labs uh, similar structures. So they are very important for us. Um, one of the projects that are financed is called Ecom for Future. And for the Swedish part of the project, uh, a living lab called HSB Living Lab will play a very central part in testing. And we actually wanted to uh, put the living lab in the center for this uh, talk and have therefore invited Emma Sarin from HSB Living Lab to tell us more about living labs and what, what role they play in this. Uh, so, Emma, I saw you previously. Yeah. <laughs> now I see you again. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so, I would like to just start by asking you, what is HSB Living Lab? Uh, yes, HSB Living Lab, it's a house in Gothenburg that is both a permanent home for about 40 persons at the same time as it is a laboratory. And this is a place where we develop the future and sustainable housing, both how we build houses in a more sustainable way, with what materials, with what techniques, but also how we run and manage the building during their lifetime, and also how we can make people uh, live and behave more sustainable in their homes. And in HSP Living Lab, the building in Gothenburg, uh, everything is super accessible for researchers because everything in the building can be replaced and rebuilt. We have 2000 sensors measuring everything that's going on. Uh, and also the tenants are part of the infrastructure that the researcher are available, available to get. So in this house, it's an open arena where anyone uh, can apply to do research about sustainable housing together with us. Uh, and so far we've been running our living lab for eight years and we started about 200 projects in the house so far. Yeah, thank you. I have to say that since I am kind of have been part of the energy research community in um, in Sweden, I have uh, seen other projects that that make use of this uh, living lab. Yeah. Um, so why are living labs so important for projects like this? Uh, I can, of course, give you 100 reasons for that, but <laughs> maybe I should focus on the most important. Uh, one of the most important is that in a living lab, you can do research in a real environment. Uh, in HSP Living Lab, our house is a full scale up and running apartment building. We have residents, we have property managers, we have electric company, cleaners, mailmen, everything. Uh, and everything is part of the research infrastructure. So here we, we are able to see the whole picture. Uh, you can test technology itself. But also, uh, you can learn more about installation, maintenance, the user experience, how well or maybe not well it works with other systems in the house and so on. So we used to say that here you can learn things you didn't even know you needed to learn. 
And also an important, important thing with living labs is that it, there are free zones. Here we can test new ideas and techniques uh, in like a risk-free environment. And also it's important because um, here you can both succeed and you can fail and both are important results. So this allows people to be more brave and innovative than if you needed, if you're uh, about to test in a real environment or in real houses. Uh, and also another important part with living labs is the educational part, because we think that a living lab are able to speed up the pace of innovations because when more people and stakeholders can walk around and see and feel the new techniques, uh, when you can try it yourself and talk to the people using it, it becomes more easy to understand and more easy to accept new technologies. I think that's the most uh, important uh, things with the Living Lab. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you actually kind of started a little bit to answer my next question with, with what you said just now. Um, but as I mentioned, I think this is maybe the third time I mentioned it, uh, we we really uh, want to see technology like spread and transition on a local and regional level, and of course, you know, change the world. But yeah. uh, that's that's the next step. Um, so, what role does the Living Lab play in development and transition on the local and regional level? Uh, I think a Living Lab offers a place to meet across boundaries. Because it's uh, an important in, it's an important arena for different stakeholders to meet, to network, and trying to solve complex problems together. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, I think a big important force is the force of the living lab that um, it is able to speed up the innovations. Uh, and also we have seen that like this kind of explorative arena that brings different people together also offers a great ground for developing new business cases around new technologies. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as, as a living lab or a representative of a living lab, what are your expectations um, you know, on, on the projects that you accept into the living lab? Um, apart from the uh, legal parts, uh, our expectations are quite easy. Uh, first of all, have fun. Uh, use the uniqueness of HSB Living Lab that you can't get anywhere else. Uh, connect with other projects and other disciplines and meet over boundaries. Take the opportunity to do that. And be brave and innovative. Uh, both fail and success counts. Uh, and share your results with others because it's smarter to build on each other's knowledge than starting from scratch all over again every time. Yeah, that is true. That is actually a requirement in uh, the set partnership that that knowledge needs to be shared with others that might be able to make use of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so is there anything that you would like to add before we wrap up? Yeah, come and see us in Gothenburg if you have the possibility and uh, you're welcome to apply to do your research or projects in HSB Living Lab if you want to. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, then I will uh, uh, end uh, and leave the floor to Hannele. Oh, that, thank you, Tina. But yeah, absolutely. Now, now we're on to the next challenge. Thank you, Tina. Uh, number six, integrated industrial energy systems. Hanali Holtenen, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So um, to start with a brief introduction of, of our focus area, and challenge. So we look at industrial energy systems that are integrated in other networks all the way to the to the national networks. We hope to achieve emission reductions, a renewable utilization, for example, hydrogen and carbon capture and utilization. 
And the challenge is, is really to do the smart sector coupling in the industrial energy systems to increase flexibility in power and energy systems to adapt new technologies for reduction of process related uh, emissions and also removing industrial greenhouse gas emissions from the carbon cycle. So we will uh, first start with um, uh, an interview with um, a previous project that is related to the theme. So we have uh, Richard Fornell from RISE uh, Research Institute in Sweden. Hello, Richard. And um, Hello. you said that, that um, a European project Coral is, is actually something that would be um, relevant for our industrial energy system theme. So, would you like to just uh, shortly introduce this ongoing project? Yes, certainly. Uh, thank you for the invitation and hi everyone. So, uh, my name is Rika Fnell. I work as a senior researcher at RISE in Sweden and we are participating in this Coralis project. It's a Horizon 2020 project that started in 2020 and it ends next year and it's an innovation action project. It, the total budget is about 23 million euros, so it's a pretty big project um, and it has three major demonstrator sites that you see on this screen, Brescia in Italy, Escombreras in Spain and Trevi in Sweden and then we have Three follower cases as well, and um, the main sort of objective of this project, the focus is on industrial symbiosis, so sector coupling, as you talked about or mentioned here, and and it's <clears throat> focused on decarbonization, not only of energy but also other resources. But there is a lot of energy integration aspects involved in the demonstrators that connect to the CT partnership TRI6. <clears throat> uh, so, so one part of this project is to demonstrate different symbiotic solutions in these three uh, big demonstrators in Brescia, the steel industry is the main focus for different steel companies are involved in, in, the, in the region. Uh, in Escombreras, it's a chemical uh, company, Fertiberia, uh, in an industrial park. And then in, in Sweden, there's a connection between uh, a pulp and paper company and, and uh, uh, food production using uh, excess heat and, and uh, carbon dioxide from blue gas. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the, the what another main sort of the main perspective of, of this project also is to expand or widening the, the, the perspectives on symbiosis from te just technological perspectives to also economic and managerial and other. That's why I have the tri triangle to the to the left. So we're developing red a number of different readiness levels in, in, uh, in, the, in the project and look at different perspectives. Yeah, I'll stop there. So we should have time for the other questions. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so what is your experience in, in um, exploitation of your results? So how, how, what's your approach and, and what are the challenges you see there? Well, yeah, in the crowd, it's, we're in the middle of the project right now. And uh, for the technical demonstrators and the, the, the technical enablers that are sort of being demonstrated, and in, in, even in the Swedish case, it's actually already being commercialized to some extent. They're already building and, and will start production in the greenhouse, for example. Uh, so, so. The exploitation is done by the partners, and uh, this is since this is a pretty high TRL. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's uh, what 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 is more interesting to discuss is sort of how how do you 
exploit or create value from the learnings from this kind of projects and and uh, because as as the previous speaker said it's been a bit turbulent times the, the past few years in europe and and this also affected of course when you have big investments in these types of projects and there are a lot of learnings that we have experienced in in developing the project and the processes and <clears throat> that I think can be of value for a lot of stakeholders. But I think the important thing with exploitation is to, to say something smart quickly here is to that you should really start working with that early on in the project directly to work with exploitation and also collaborate with other projects and different stakeholders to transfer knowledge and, and also receive feedback. Um, <clears throat> I think that that's really important to not sort of reinvent the wheel and, and really get some sort of continuous value from what you're doing. Yeah. Indeed, thanks for sharing. And this is, of course, very important for for us when when we are dealing with projects that are just starting. So very valuable uh, experience. Thank you. Uh, how do you say? How do you see generally the the challenges in the in our thematic area of industrial energy systems? What what are the sort of bigger topics that that should be worked on? The most important thing, if I want need um, to mention one, I, I think the system perspective and and adding different perspectives on on transition and and working on development is is fundamental. It's it's very easy to get stuck in finding technical solutions and then optimizing them, but then if you want to implement and create real impact, it's often not the technical solution in itself that hinders development. It's it's other perspectives in the system. We've seen it in, in our project. We've experienced it. We had to move one of our demonstrators due to other than technical reasons. And we see it in, in symbiosis development in Europe in many different cases. So I, I think that we, we need to realize that systems are driven by people and people are sort of making the decisions it's not the technology so we, you have to look at a broader perspective and, and understand that in order to actually create real impact i think that's uh, i can talk for hours about this but i'll just leave it at that if you want to know more or discuss then please contact me <laughs> okay Thank, thank you, and uh, and also good luck uh, for any future proposals you're making in in the set partnership. Yeah. Um, I understand Rice is very active, and and you also have some ideas for future projects in our partnership. So hopefully yeah. see you again next year yeah, in yeah. a new project. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. then we move on. Uh, Let's look at the projects that have gotten uh, funding now. If you can show the slides again, please. Uh, for some reason, yes, thank you. Um, so we have three new projects starting, um, and one is related to uh, recovery boiler operation in paper and pulp industry. Um, related to the carbon capture, enabling carbon capture, and two of the projects are related to uh, thermal storage uh, in providing um, thermal energy and heat to industry. And we have now um, uh, two project interviews for the rest of our time. So we will uh, start with the, the pulp and paper industry project, where we have uh, Patrick Urias from Åbo Akademi University in Finland uh, coordinating the project OxyCraft. So Patrick, are you there? Yes, I'm For a here. Short, Hello. Uh, yes. Interview. Yes. Sure. And um, can you move the slide one more, please? It was 
yeah, one more slide forward. Oh, okay, now I can move it myself. Thank you. Okay, so um, here is just one uh, one slider for this new project, Oxycraft. So, Patrick, uh, can you just shortly describe what you are aiming to do? Well, um, yes, of course. Thank you for asking. And uh, uh, this is a, a, a attempt to to introduce oxy firing for uh, recovery boilers. And recovery boilers, I don't know if you are familiar with what the recovery boiler is, but it is in the pulp and paper uh, industry, one of the major uh, uh, installations. And, uh, and it's very crucial for the pulp industry to be profitable. Uh, the, the recovery boiler in itself is made for, for to recover the, uh, the cooking chemicals for the, the, the to, loosen the fibers from the wood. So that is the main purpose of the recovery boilers. Then the side uh, effect is that it really produces large amounts of energy at the same time, which is now, uh, so it's kind of a multi-purpose boiler. And today it is uh, uh, fired with air in different levels as usually in boilers. Uh, but now we are introducing the concept of firing with uh, uh, oxygen. And in that sense, uh, concentrating the CO2 gases in the fluid gas for further capture or use. Yeah. And um, what partners are you are you having? What what industry partners, for example? Well, we, the partners we have is we have uh, from Spain, University of Zaragoza, and then from Sweden, the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH. And then we have these uh, uh, like uh, major uh, manufacturing companies of recovery boilers or also uh, pulp industry manufacturers, so that is Valamet and Andres. And uh, also then uh, a USA based company that is a utility owner of, of recovery boilers, uh, international paper. So uh, what I could say about these, that is uh, that, uh, let's say that Andrit and Valamet, they build about 90 and close to 100% of big recovery boilers in the world today. So in that sense, it is a, a, a they have also the initiative here to 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 this uh, project, uh, and uh, they they put the idea and we've uh, worked on it further and and so it is a direct connection to to manufacturers and and then their customers. Yes. Uh... So the exploitation is is in your project uh, very much hands on already, um, and I I guess the main um, impact you're you're searching is the emission reductions in future. Right, of course. To do, uh, I mean, uh, black liquor today is already like a biomass based uh, uh, fuel. If you look at that, because it comes from wood. But if by by introducing also like uh, concentrating uh, CO2 into the flue gas and maybe and capture it uh, or uh, further use it, then it would be like a negative uh, emission, uh, CO2 emission. Uh, and in that sense, yes, it, it would be capture the greenhouse uh, uh, gas. Yes, and there is a pretty huge potential. For the, the, the yeah. sector, yeah, the, the potential is is huge. Around the world, there are about now seven hundred uh, recovery boilers. Uh, we have like in Finland, we have like uh, sixteen, seventeen recovery boilers. Sweden has many. Also in Spain, there is, and as as you can see there on the uh, lower uh, left hand side, uh, there is okay. It's uh, quite small that, but you can also the. the uh, the United States is the, like, say, the, the producing of biggest producer of, of black liquor today. And uh, also, as therefore, we also have international paper as a part in this project. International paper is a self-funded uh, 
participant, of course, since the USA, but they, they are eager to, to be involved as a utility owner. So, how do you see, what do you need to even better exploit the results or, or how, how do you make sure that, that then, first of all, you demonstrate that this will work, but then the next steps also will be taken? Yes, and the, that is, a, the, 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 of course, a, a question how that will happen. Uh, I mean, uh, those manufacturers, they want to ensure that they have the technology to go further with this. Uh, but of course, they do not build a recovery boiler based on the te this uh, technology, which is probably somewhat more costly, at least in the beginning. Uh, if it, the customers don't ask for it. And why would the customers ask for it? Uh, well, that comes then back to the politicians, I guess. The politicians and the people, I guess. Yeah, what yeah, well, was also to, mentioning. That's right. Yeah, yeah, but it has to be an incentive for, for like an economic uh, incentive for that. That's right. That's right. Policy has a, a big thing. Okay, thank you, Patrick, for this. And then uh, we move on to the next um, project and interview. So that's with uh, Felix Kugler, who is the group manager in Fraunhofer uh, and coordinating uh, the East Demo project. Hello, Felix. Hello. So um, just a brief introduction on what you're aiming to do with the East Demo project. Yeah, well, uh, hello everybody. My name is Felix Kugler. I'm a very new new to Fraunhofer. I'm a new group manager there for three months now. Um, but I hopefully can answer all your questions uh, to the project, Hanele. Um, so now let me introduce you to uh, the ISS Demo project. Its mission is to drive the energy transition in industrial applications with a specific focus on process steam. So to increase uh, the share of renewable uh, energy in, in industrial process uh, steam applications in form from uh, power to heat, uh, we need a flexible, efficient and highly dynamic uh, energy storage. Uh, our goal is to demonstrate these attributes using a high temperature latent heat storage based on a metal melt. Uh, we aim to achieve TRL7 from TRL5, implementing the technology in an industrial process steam application with a capacity of approximately uh, one megawatt hour, operating the device for a minimum uh, of 300 cycles and 1000 operating hours. Uh, we seek to showcase uh, its efficiency and functionality in high temperature application, um, something about 250 to 500 degree for process uh, steam generation. The innovative aspect lies in the high, high dynamics of the storage and direct steam generation. Uh, in parallel, uh, ISS Demo will address process integration in various industries, uh, chemical industry, pulp and paper, and food beverage. This is uh, beverages is the German showcase through application uh, scenarios. Uh, ISIS Demo brings uh, together experts from industry and academia, um, plant engineering, and energy consumers to guide both the technical solution uh, towards market entry and the integration of power to heat process. Uh, steam applications. Yes, thank you. And I'm, I'm happy to see that there is a, a big um, flexibility uh, focus in this project, which will be very welcome in future power and energy systems. So, how do you see the, the um, exploitation um, of the project results uh, from this project? Mm, I think. Um... The success of our results may pave the way for industry uh, partners to invest in our demo storage. 
uh, or planned exploration includes the potential need for support in impact tools and capacity building uh, to further uh, propel our advancements. Okay, thank you. And this will be very interesting to see uh, once uh, the years pass and we start seeing the results and also the impact work that hopefully the partnership can also support you with. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Felix. I think it's time to uh, wrap up this uh, TRI 6. Um, I just have the one uh, final slide here for, for wrap up. So we have really um, potential for delivering uh, a, a good set of new knowledge and, and close some knowledge gaps for power to heat and um, and pulp and paper industry carbon capture uh, and looking forward to to these projects, but also uh, similar projects um, in the joint call that is currently open. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hanali. Uh, now we're going on to challenge number seven, integration in the built environment. Uh, Stefan Novak, uh, welcome. You have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you, Christina, and uh, thanks uh, for still being with us here uh, before lunch to talk about, uh, I think, a very important topic, which is uh, the built environment and the energy uh, integration in the built environment, um, which uh, has also been uh, mentioned yesterday. If you have been participating yesterday's uh, conference, you have already heard the role that buildings play in the whole energy picture in terms of the energy use, also the material use, and the associated greenhouse gas emissions. On the other hand, in terms of the community active in uh, projects like Aeronets or now in CTP, there is not like, for instance, um, Arge has very nicely shown for the, um, for the TRI-3, a large and long-lasting community which has transnational projects running for many years in this sector. So that explains why uh, there is an additional challenge here, bringing transnational projects into the scope of, uh, of uh, the CTP. And finally, there is also uh, a lot of synergies with some of the TRIs that we've heard about in this morning and some of the projects mentioned the building perspective very explicitly. So therefore, the TRI-7 mission is really to provide solutions and technologies for existing and new buildings to become an inactive element in the um, energy system. And overall, this is operating in a very complex context with a lot of other initiatives uh, and, and technology platforms which are active in this area. So, uh, I won't go into the details of the call, but I leave this for your reference for later consultation if you're interested to learn about where we put the focus of the present call in 2023. And I uh, would like to just focus on the point that we are uh, somewhere between the individual technologies such as developed in TRI 2, maybe in TRI 4 on the thermal side, and the TRI-5, uh, which is looking at the regional systems, the TRI-7 is really looking in between and focusing on the integration of those technologies in the built environment and the buildings and the interaction of those buildings in an aerial concept. So this is the focus that uh, TRI-7 has, and we are emphasizing this even more uh, at uh, the 2023 call. So in, in a nutshell, the TRI-7 focus is really interface between individual technologies and the system addressing the built environment and building related aspects, identifying the integration aspects, and this for the different carriers of electricity, heat and cold, be it in generation, use and storage, and also addressing the network issues smart operation and management, and not to forget the role of digitalization in this whole procedures. So this is uh, very briefly 
what uh, TRI7 is all about. Now, <clears throat> I will not go into more detail, but rather look at where we stand today. In fact, having no uh, previous Aeronet in this sector, we have chosen, and also for timing reasons, not to search for another EU project telling us uh, how uh, these technologies are being developed, but rather giving uh, the focus on one of the projects which are uh, starting this uh, autumn. There are three actually in TRI-7 which are starting now, the new heating integrated, which will be presented in more detail by Moritz Walter from ICT tomorrow, uh, to just in a minute, of course. Then uh, the transmit project, which is a, a PV related uh, project, which has of course relationships to TRI-2, but here it's more about the uh, integration of this technology also into building components such as windows with uh, the coordinator being the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory. And finally, the reform project, which is about power generation from perovskite architectural elements. Also here, the interface between the technology, the per perovskite the solar PV technology on the one hand, and the architectural integration of this technology into the building. So I would like to give now the floor to Moritz Walter to tell us more about one of these projects, which is the new heat integrated uh, project. Please, Moritz, the floor is yours. Yeah, hello, everyone, and thanks, Stefan, for the uh, great introduction. Um, my name is Moritz Walter. Um, I'm a research associate at Fraunhofer Institute for Chemical Technology in the south of Germany. And I'm very glad uh, to have the possibility to introduce uh, to this large audience um, our research project, New Heat Integrated, um, that we will start um, uh, this Nove uh, in November. Um, yeah, uh, as we have our kickoff meeting uh, in November, I will just uh, present our ideas in joyful expectation um, to let follow then uh, in the next year the first results. Um, so uh, first, um, in a nutshell, what do we want to do? Um, the main objective uh, of our project is um, to develop an innovative and uh, inexpensive solution for um, building integrated thermal energy storage. And um, also we want, or especially we want to focus on the optimization of this um, storage system to the emerging um, heat generation technology um, of heat pumps in combination with surface heating systems. So um, a, syst a heating system with, uh, low, um, with low temperatures. And how do we want to do this? Um, uh, we want to adapt and put into practice uh, modular uh, high performance latent heat energy term uh, thermal energy storage system which already um, exists um, in another um, uh, shape and we want to um, develop it further to um, be more suitable to um, to uh, um, heat pump driven heating systems and um, also um, we want to implement um, holistic and AI supported monitoring and control system for efficient um, system uh, uh, driving. Um, here, I'll, I'll give you um, slightly more detail into the, uh, or insight into the project. So um, what we want to do is, um, uh, we have uh, put uh, into practice this uh, storage system based on um, a modular PCM storage. Um, uh, until now, uh, in the storage, they use a, a material um, which uh, works at 55 degrees to um, to provide heat for our um, hot water and the heating uh, system applications. And um, therefore, the the heat has to be uh, provided at a temperature niveau of about 60 to 70 degrees Celsius and this is not the optimal uh, niveau for heat pumps, as we all know. So our uh, main target is to lower a large um, amount of heat uh, that we need, um, lower the temperature niveau, 
to, um, to a niveau where heat pumps uh, work much more efficient. And um, therefore, um, we use this modular um, system as a basis, and um, we adapt it um, to the energy needs in, uh, in our uh, showcases, uh, living houses for uh, one family households. Um, we want to demonstrate the system so uh, at three de demo sites um, all across Europe, in one in Finland, in Vasa, uh, one house in the southeast of Germany, and another in um, Czech Republic. Okay, so I have some noise in the background. I hope that you can understand me well. Um, so here I have the highlights of the heat integrated. Um, it's fine. Yeah, okay, <laughs> perfect. So um, we uh, have uh, actually in the heating demand of, of such a household, we have a, um, a three, three quarters uh, of, this, of the heating, um, of the heating needed uh, at a low temperature niveau uh, for space heating and one quarter for the uh, hot water. So uh, we still have to deliver um, heat at 55 degrees, that's for sure, but a large amount of heat would be sufficient to deliver it at a lower um, temperature niveau. Um, and uh, yeah, we will compartmental co uh, divide our storage um, adapted to this uh, share. Um, Second uh, highlight is that we um, can reduce the storage volume compared to a, to a hot water um, heat storage versus the, the standard um, heat storage um, today um, uh, to be able to install our storage also in um, older buildings that are renewalated. Um, yeah. Um, next point is that we have um, a PCM storage which is based on a salt hydrate. Um, that uh, is able to super cool. So uh, that means that it doesn't um, release the heat uh, when it's uh, cooling down. So we can uh, store the heat um, for several days uh, with nearly zero heat losses. And um, on the other hand, we are able to, um, to trigger the heat release um, uh, at the moment that we, uh, we need it. And, um, Therefore, we can also add a resilient uh, uh, component to our concept. Um, then uh, we have our uh, control system um, where a large sensor network um, will be able to gather um, the information of the whole energy system in the building. And um, based on um, AI and machine learning uh, algorithms, um, the control system will be able to predict an optimal uh, um, operation strategy for the storage loading and uh, yeah. Um, here I have uh, put uh, our work plan as a short version. Um, we have separated the, the um, project into a development phase and a demonstration phase. And um, of course, uh, in the development phase, we will uh, we will develop um, a suitable um, heat storage material uh, or refine it. Um, we will um, uh, refine the storage um, because uh, we have other materials, other um, uh, material um, compatibilities um, that we need. Uh, corrosion is always a, a point that we uh, have to focus on. And um, of course, we have the system integration um, part um, and uh, we want then um, go to the demonstration phase and uh, operate our system and monitor it uh, for at least one whole year uh, at the three demo sites. And um, since I'm more the technical guy, um, I focused uh, on on these highlights so far. But uh, nevertheless, um, New Heat Integrated is uh, is more complex and. Uh, has also a large uh, communication and dissemination part uh, where we want to, to share um, our findings and also um, focus on one big problem with new storage technologies that um, has uh, identified our industrial partner um, who uh, has his uh, first PCM storage um, 
and tries to get it into the market. Um, the problem is that the stakeholders um, often do not accept new technologies. They, uh, they, um, they put uh, into practice um, what they know that it works. And um, uh, therefore, we, we want to start very early to um, uh, yeah, um, take them on board and uh, inform them about the technology, um, about the implementation um, possibilities, the functionality, and uh, how easy it is uh, to implement it. And um, yeah, uh, to do this, uh, we, um, we have our three demo sites. Uh, we will uh, go to, uh, uh, to conferences and uh, fees and yeah, use uh, variable, uh, various dissemination channels um yes um okay so um here uh, i show the the consortium of our project um as i already mentioned we um uh have partners from three countries um first the fraunhofer association with two institutes in germany the iwu in dresden and um, the ict uh, then we have the technical university of ostrava um, which will be uh, responsible for the system control and the sensor management. Uh, the University of Vasa in Finland, um, they do thermal system planning and also um, the social assessment, um, which I um, mentioned uh, before. Um, then we have the BME and Dr. Gorbs and Partners, GmbH, uh, from Germany. Um, they um, provide the the base basic storage um if i can say it like that and um yeah we will uh, develop the the new storage concept and uh we have nola e in finland um which is uh energy planning and monitoring agency and they uh, have really a large um, database for various application cases and uh, based on that they um, they developed uh, system control algorithms and models and um, are also implementing the AI component. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, here I, I put uh, my contact information and also uh, from the project coordinator, um, uh, Professor Kularik. And um, yeah, additionally, uh, Stefan asked me uh, to. Um, yeah, to talk about the the pros and cons uh, or the pros <laughs> that we uh, we see with the uh, CTP and um, I, for my part, I can say that uh, on the last two days uh, I got an impressive taste of the networking and potential of this um, platform. And um, yeah, I think that especially yesterday they these um, proposed three level um, cooperation formats. Uh, where uh, the the exchange between the projects um, is uh, yeah put into focus, I, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I think um, those three um, components will really um, help to to identify overlap between um, uh, yeah uh, between the projects and uh, to find and rebuild uh, follow up consortia and applications. If you have further questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask um, afterwards or via email. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Moritz, for this uh, insight into this uh, interesting project. And in particular, I'd like to highlight uh, not so much the technological aspects which every project has, but the fact that you have also identified many of practical and operational questions which uh, you encounter when you develop a technology and then implement it into a specific environment, such as a building or a network of buildings. And, and here, maybe uh, just one question related to that. Where do you see the big, biggest challenge here? Is it in terms of, of the partners you need uh, for this aspect? Is it more for the time you need? Or, or the communication to overcome the barriers that you mentioned, where do you see the, the biggest challenges? Um, I think um, in terms of implementation, it's, it's really the, the communi communicational part. Um, 
to uh, to address the the right stakeholders um, to address them adequately and um, because uh, yeah it's it's it it starts with the end user but um, the end user asks his uh, uh, his energy system planner and that one has his uh, installation um, uh, um, company and uh, everybody um, yeah you have to communicate um, and highlight uh, different um, aspects uh, or focus on different aspects and I think that's um, uh, it's very hard to to manage um, and but we um, we we are very uh, optimistic that we uh, we can create a concept to get everyone on board. Um, yeah. Okay, and if you have one wish you can address to the CTP partnership, what would that be? <laughs> um, uh, one wish uh, that's hard to, to say, but um, I. I think that it's already on a on a very good way and already already provides a very good um, platform for for networking and and finding partners and I think that's um, that's also a, a key component to to the dissemination activities that I mentioned um, to to share um, and to communicate the the research activities to um, to a large um, audience uh, from all the uh, different, um, uh, yeah, parts. So, uh, research, uh, and, uh, customers and industry. And yeah, I think that's, that's very well. So there, I have no further wishes. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. If you have no further wishes, uh, others have many more wishes. So <laughs> it's good to have a speaker who, uh, is already happy with what we have today. <laughs> Thanks once again, uh, Moritz, um, and we stay in touch, of course, uh, with your project. Wish you success. And I'd like to just wrap up, uh, not being long, just uh, the Thank key you. question here in TRI 7, I think, and it was also addressed by Moritz, is really the engagement with the community, not just the technological aspects, but really engaging with the community involved. Here it is the building community, the construction sector. Etc. And with that, I would like to give back to uh, Christina and hopefully we'll be in time to wrap up this whole session. Perfect. Thank you, Stefan. That was a really a good uh, segue to the next thing I'd like to say. Uh, now we have been able to see all of the, the, the challenges, the seven challenges we have in the Clean Energy Transition Partnership. Uh, so, so this session is now coming to a close, but before we, we go to the next point, I'd like to just uh, show you the agenda for two o'clock here. Um, at two, there will be a focus on the joint call for this year, 2023, and an opportunity to, to get your questions answered. Uh, so the, at two o'clock, there'll be first uh, a discussion about the call structure, the topics that of the call modules, and also the national national eligibility rules and transnational rules, of course. Then we'll have the Q and A, uh, followed by if you have specific questions uh, when it comes to the different thematic areas, the challenges we've we've gone through today, uh, you'll have an opportunity in breakout sessions uh, to ask your questions. After that, at 3.15, we'll have uh, an opportunity to hear a little bit about tips about how to find good consortium partners. Uh, finally, at uh, 3.30, we will sort of wrap up the conference, uh, but uh, we're hoping that people will take the opportunity after this conference to start doing the networking that we just uh, were discussing to have booked meetings through our B2Match sites and continue uh, bilateral meetings. Uh, with any potential partners for next year's for this this call this year's call. So, uh, with that said, I would just like to thank everyone, all of our uh, TRI uh, representatives that have uh, taken us through these wonderful uh, and enlightening and uh, fascinating uh, uh, the thematic areas and all of the project representatives as well. It's been a very exciting uh, morning. And now I hope that you will have a, a lovely break uh, for lunch and that we will see everyone uh, back again 
at 2 p.m. Thank you very much, everyone.